when don't it, when rely it on coffee to, me, to start your day. <laughs> right, exactly. No, no, no. Eat more pickles. So you're not perfect is what you're saying. Mm. <laughs> I never said it was. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, saying you are. <laughs> right. saying he's impressive. But my Ladies and gentlemen, sucks. we got him. <laughs> yeah, you got Saga. me. Okay, done. Interview over. Uh, I got a summer job as a lab technician in Mastron Hospital. Uh, and then I, I also then became a lab technician in a different department. Um, so I was in the neuro, neurology department, the microbiology department. And then I moved to the, the, um, the pediatrics GI department. This sounds not credible, except that you made enough money to then open an auto shop. Yeah. So <laughs> I used that to finance the, the shop. It's overkill on the drone, but then the audience will get to see us suffering with each shot. Oh, geez, on the shoulder. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Challenge accepted. I'll bring my shotgun. And if it doesn't look like everybody else, mm -hmm. then I, I can't move forward being different from everybody else because I'm in a family. I'm right. in a community. I'm in a church. I'm in a, and everybody sees me everywhere. And how does this person fit into my life? Will I have acceptance exactly. from, from my parents? Will I have acceptance from my peers and, and the other gals? You know, well, I look funny at the wedding when I'm trying to catch the bouquet, you know. It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and and those are all, like, things that, like, when I talked about the, the, the minority identity development theory, right, it's like, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not just you experiencing it, right? Mm. Other people are also experiencing it. Other people are conforming to what society is telling them to do. Financial markets. I'm assuming stocks. What what what's your story behind mm -hmm. that, and kind of uh, how did you get started? Wait, how'd you make the hundred grand to open the auto shop with? We need the secret to making that, tons of money. Uh, okay, so uh, similar situation because I had the experience back in the first recession, right? Yeah. I learned a lot about the energy sector, and it's ironic because it's been a big focus lately as of now. So, mm. um, but uh, I so when I when I when oil became like my big bre bread and butter. Uh, or the energy sector became my bread and butter in terms of like my investment portfolio. Hello, family and friends. Welcome to another Talks with Lemonade. This is available to the billions around the world on YouTube in 4K and audio streaming services like Pandora, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. And now onto the podcast. All right. So Joey, I, I wrote myself uh, from your bio, I wrote a little intro that I thought we should start out with. Currently, Sounds you're working good. as a learning and development business partner in the critical in this clinical research field. Mm -hmm. You have have or you you have or manage your own uh, car repair shop. You've yep. wor you've worked in all three sectors of public, private, and nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And if we have time, uh, your parents are Vietnamese v Vietnam War refugees, and you being raised Vietnamese American, and the issues of identity and the and a third cultured kid feeling. Mm -hmm. All well, right, so let's let's wait, 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 wait. Did you say you just clinical research consulting, and he runs an auto shop? <laughs> let's yep. let's hear from Joey. <laughs> I, I did, this is sounds impossible. <laughs> oh, the, there's there's a lot of things that uh that it's just scratching the surface on that, but okay. Once you hear once you hear it, you'll you'll understand. All right. Well, that was, that was a bit of a pump up. I'm excited now. All right, let's go into it. So, um, how are you doing a car repair shop while doing clinical research? Uh, is it a hot rod shop or a? I need it's oil just change. a general repair shop. Yeah. So it's actually my best friend's um dream to uh have have his own car shop so he's been a mechanic for 13 years oh. and um you know he he finally got a job uh in clinical research to i'm oh, sorry in pharmaceuticals to like repair the actual machinery to um uh you know the that that makes the drugs and that was paying him really well and but you know he he always wanted to have his own car shop and so um Wait, like, like I, there's I, a machine that spits out the pills uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. like the, like a Wonka factory minus the candy, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it depends on whether you consider quaaludes like candy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so like um, in the past pandemic, I basically turned 
uh, 11k of my money into 120k, uh, and then from there uh, through through investments, and then from there I basically just had the capital to basically uh, finance you know an opportunity that he saw. Wait, and so did so you buy I'm, you bought GameStop or AMC? No, 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 no. I actually, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that is because. Uh, as that was happening, I knew it was going to attract a lot of like my friends and family. So I started my own uh, uh, investment consulting group, uh, not like an official one, but just one to just kind of like keep an eye on and sort of educate and train my friends and family so that they wouldn't fall prey to the kind of like uh, hype that they were going into as they themselves wanted to become retail investors themselves. So, uh, I, so, so I basically- a create, private you know, club where you talk to your personal friends it's actually not private uh so i i kept it open but my my main focus and goal was to ensure that folks of marginalized communities were able to get the financial education and and fundamentals mm. that uh i would be able to afford them so i started off with just like a facebook message group and mm. then because the scale got so large i was just ending up answering the same questions over and over so i yeah. just decided to just create a youtube channel well, actually, I use my gaming YouTube channel to just like house unlisted mm. videos and I would just link them. Then we had mm. a Discord and it just got spiraled out of control. And then there was like 37 people plus. And then uh, eventually I just, um, you know, just kept it so that I, I was trying to uh, create sort of like a resource uh, guide for them. And then, and then from there on, they can just ask questions and I can give them updates in terms of what are the major macroeconomic sort of situations that could affect the market and sort of like kind of what things they could expect. So long story short, you know, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that people weren't going to fall prey to like, you know, the the um what's it called like there was like one one person that was really in, uh heavy into wanting to invest in in like the naked stock right like the naked oh. shoe brand and like i was just like what are you talking about dude like that thing's mm. never gonna take off or or blackberry like somehow some way they're gonna make a comeback and so there was just oh, a lot of they, stuff blackberries mm. are very popular in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly right, right? If, oh. if, if only we were reverting ourselves back into like toddlers <laughs> and then yeah that might have been a good buy at that time um, okay so so on this podcast we're not financial advisors and we do not mm -hmm. dispense we're just dudes talking yep yeah. This is for entertainment purposes only. Only exactly, in case, exactly. In case any of the audience wants to buy BlackBerry, <laughs> but if I had been on Joey's uh, Discord, I wouldn't be holding uh, what a GameStop and AMC right now, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm not down. I'm just. We're, what, what were your thoughts back on AMC and GameStop back? What was that a I mean, year ago? Was it? Yeah, like I that, mean, yeah. even there's some weird activity, you know, happening throughout afterwards, but. Long story short, there were still some folks uh, within my circle who still dabbled into it, but at least they understood the risks at mm. that point by the time that I sort of like, you know, sort of alluded it to it. But for the most part, you know, I was dealing with a spectrum of folks, right? And my investment sort of uh, uh, education kind of uh, appealed in, in a way that I could allow it so that it could be digestible on both ends of the spectrums of people who who wanted more risk and reward and then people who were very risk adverse mm -hmm. and in fact one of my best income based strategies came from those folks who were very risk adverse and 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 it, you know it, it's it's just been the thing that i've just been doing lately yeah okay well so this sounds not credible except that you made enough money to then open an auto shop yeah so I used that to finance the, the shop for my best friend, but he insisted to not just be an investor, but simply wanting to be in a partnership with me. And I was working full time uh, in, my, in the clinical research company uh, yeah. at the time. Am, are we allowed to like dis disclaim like the companies or? Yeah, just you could like, say whatever you want. That's up to you. Oh yeah. yeah. So the company is, you know, Elego Health Research um, and it actually just acquired the original company I was well, working hold, for called. Let me add, mm -hmm. uh, it depends on, um, I'm gonna flag it just in case. Did you sign Got an NDA? It. Yeah, it just depends on what you're going to release. Like you could talk about the company, but if if by chance if you I don't know if the company would think that anything you're saying is oh, offensive I get you. towards their Yeah. It's it's up to you though. I mean, it's yeah. up to you. No, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it, I don't think so. I okay. think it's a uh, yeah. And also we could delete it all later anyways, but just FYI. Yeah. Sure thing. So, yeah, I'll just I'll just say it generically. So, 
Um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, I have my full time job in a clinical research company, uh, you know, designing and implementing trainings uh, for different departments. And then, you know, I, I definitely knew I couldn't do that full time, wrench cars and like, you know, mm. <laughs> uh, go on uh, Microsoft team meetings at the same time. So <laughs> uh, I basically agreed to just go into part time partnership. And so I would just manage like the accounting, the marketing, the, the you know, the finance stuff while he did business operations from the, you know, the eight to five kind of deal. And it's been working out pretty well. We actually broke even just literally last month. Oh, wait, that was nice. February. So nice. end of February. <clears throat> yeah and that was just december is when we purchased it so we purchased it at end of december broke even in february and we're in pretty good shape right now oh you're killing yeah. it dude yeah yeah that's amazing i mean yeah. you hear about i hear about so many businesses that start out and it takes uh five, years. four or five years and even then probably 99 percent don't make it too wait Correct, what, are you yeah. what are you charging for oil changes uh depends so normal oil changes are like 30 <laughs> bucks and then synthetics are like 70 which is oh, typically on the, 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 the pretty much like the regular rate. Uh, we did do a March special, so we gave free uh, synthetic oil changes for anyone who had like a repair order of like 300 bucks or more oh. and free multi-point inspections for people who actually did an oil change. So, um, and yeah, so that, that, that became our busiest month. So again, getting creative with that stuff. And then I also nice. have my new, uh, you know, startup company, uh, sort of building on top of the business as well. So I'm going to basically, without giving away too much, you know, try to create the next Uber of like, you know, um, car repair services, essentially. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, like I could get on the app and Lim will come over and fix my car. Uh, more, more so like removing the, the crazy logistics behind dropping off your car, picking it up and getting yeah. a rental car and things of that nature. All that can be one stop shop with the click of an app kind of deal. Nice. So mm -hmm. on the making the 120,000 that you needed, what was the, uh, what was the secret sauce there? Was it just investing in the right stocks or cryptocurrencies or what? Uh, well, so, so my first, I would say if you go way, way, way back, um, mm. my sister actually recruit, my sister actually, uh, helped me open up my first mutual fund when I was 16 years old. And, um, from there I learned a lot about like financial kind of like, like diversification basics. And then when I was 18 years old, ironically, she recruited me to that the to the same MLM that she was in, <laughs> which <laughs> sold life insurance and 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 securities. Right. So by the time that I was nineteen years old, uh, yeah, nineteen years old, I had my life insurance ins uh, certification license and my Series Six and Sixty Three, oh, and wow. so uh, I mean, like, I, I it was it was kind of awkward because you know I'm like eighteen years old in in high school like trying to like hmm. sell you know uh securities and, and life insurance to my teachers like you know what i mean like so <laughs> and then every, everyone made fun everyone made fun of me saying that i was part of a pyramid scheme which at the time yes it truly was but my <laughs> my certifications and my licenses were legit so you know it was it was an uphill battle but at the same time like if i could have like endured that kind of like cold call like you know uphill kind of salesy environment like it, it, it the the skill sets that i had learned from that experience even if it wasn't profitable was helpful in the sense of like what i was able to do so did, long did story you get short, your pe teacher to buy annuities or anything <laughs> uh, no no unfortunately <laughs> yeah um, oh, okay but the, 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 the connection there was that, um, so I, I made like uh, 13 grand for uh, a summer gig uh, being on the first season of a, of a PBS TV show called Design Squad. And, and when I was a freshman in high school, I was on that show and everybody on that cast was like in college or going to college and it was an engineering competition show. So there was a $10,000 mm -hmm. Intel scholarship at the end of that. So um, it was my first experience of how there are influences externally happening mm. in a reality show. And it wasn't just purely clear cut reality. Um, what? It's not real? 
Oh man, you, well <laughs> everything about it fundamentally was real. Like we all got the same training. I all I took classes in MIT and everything, and then learned all these engineering fundamentals. Loved it, and I was killing it on the show. I was like first yes. five, six episodes. I was just winning first place and just gaining those points. And I was Fucking like, on Asian my is way. destroying here. <laughs> right, exactly right. And so. So here I am, like, as soon as, like, you know, I have, like, this healthy lead over everybody, I start to notice that, like, I got paired up with, like, some of the, like, the, the sandbag, you know, folks <laughs> in, 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 in the cast. And I was just like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah you know, I'll just endure it this, this, this episode. And then the next episode, you know, I'll kill it in the next one. And then the next yeah. one after that just kept getting dragged. And then I started to notice some weird things where, like, we're not getting awarded as many points or like winning the 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 that specific episode even right. though like our pro our our like our product was far more superior than the other so i, I saw I was noticing there was something weird and fishy going on but whatever is you know it's 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 it, at the end of the day it's you know it's it's production right but it was still a great experience i also you know that's also started my acting gigs a little bit so when i was Wait, uh, so did you say this is when you were a freshman at mit freshman in high school high school, high school high school okay yeah wow. mm -hmm. All right. and then where yeah, where you, what state are you in where are you at What's oh the... massachusetts so i was in boston at the time so okay yeah yeah that i went sense. to boston public schools and and, and 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 you know most of my life i born and raised in boston i still live in near the area i'm just south of it um, but yeah, what, what is the last stop on the red line? Last stop on the run depends on which way you're going inbound outbound outbound outbound. Okay. Well, you got to pick you got it's either Ashram or Braintree. Come on. Give me a better <laughs> question. Not, not Alewife. Alewife is the other direction. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. This guy, he's from Boston. I checked. <laughs> yeah. He's legit. <laughs> <laughs> what what line mean, do you like, take to get to Packard's corner? Packard's Corner. No, I, I never even bother. Yeah, so don't worry. <laughs> okay. He's legit. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the, the, the Bostonian check. It's, I, it's, I have to check your reality. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. There's so many folks who are from Massachusetts, but they'll yeah. keep saying they're from Boston. And mm. it, it, it even annoys me, right? And, like, I'm going to, like, you know, you know, college out in, like, western Massachusetts, and they all say from their, from Boston. I'm like... You're yeah. not from Boston. You're from like Lemonster. Get, get the fuck out of here. Like, you know. <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think we made it 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we did. <laughs> hey, where, where's nice. the first Dunkin' Donuts? That was the ever... first Dunkin' Donuts is in my city. It's in Quincy. Where You're I'm from living. Quincy. Okay, this yeah. guy's legit. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> are you from the area you've been around here it sounds like you know a lot yeah no i spent uh a couple weeks in uh boston one time uh okay yeah well, my... you learned a, a fucking lot for just a week's worth yeah <laughs> yeah geez you're, you're practically a dedicated mass hole at this point <laughs> yeah I, I, I can't do the charlestown accent though that's uh, tr that's trust another me, level. you're better off not doing it because uh, every every massachusetts person is sick and tired of everybody trying to do Bostonian <laughs> accent, so you're saving yourself the trouble. Nice. Uh, is there a large Vietnamese population in Boston? I know there's it, a lot of it, Thai people, right? In, 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 not in Boston, but in Massachusetts. And so uh, it's actually funny because um, Boston used to be the fifth largest uh, car concentration of Vietnamese and Vietnamese Americans mm. in, 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 Ma in the United States. Okay. And Dorchester in particular is a, is a neighborhood in Boston. And that's actually where I, was, I grew up. And so, mm. um, and so, yeah, like because of like, you know, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the rising rent you know and then just sort of like the takeovers of the neighborhoods with these like fancy places right yeah. everybody got forced out there was no way you could be you know more than like you know two three generations of vietnamese american in dorchester because unless if you own the the houses there you're you're not gonna stay you uh -huh. know the rents are like three times the amount that the average vietnamese family uh, could could afford so mm. they sort of spread out just like my family to the neighboring suburbs hence since hence why i'm in quincy right and every mm. people even move further than that just to get into cheaper places um yeah. so so it's a little splintered um so yeah so that's a great question um yeah because yeah. uh we, we used to be fifth i don't even know where we are in like the rankings but yeah. definitely yeah what, barely what was top it? It was 10. orange county san jose houston 
Yeah, sounds about right. And then there's like uh, right. maybe Atlanta or like somewhere in Georgia. Um, really? Yeah, ironically, that's what I found surprising too. There's a big Vietnamese population out in, in, in Georgia too. Dude, they're probably gangsters, as fuck in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, but that's so, what I want to know. I don't know what, if that's offensive, really but I think that's what's happening. What, what is interesting is I want to know a person who has a Vietnamese accent with a southern draw. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so there, there's actually a lot of Vietnamese in uh, Biloxi, right outside of New Orleans. Okay. So, so you go down to New Orleans and then you go over to Biloxi, and there's a ton of Vietnamese down there that were fishermen in the old country, and then they come here and they go, "How do I be a yeah, fisherman?" Yeah, yeah. For yeah, sure, so. yeah. Actually, that's a, a. It's funny because at my brother-in-law's um, bachelor party, I actually asked him if I could uh, go and visit a nonprofit in in New Orleans because we were in New Orleans uh, during like Carnival. A nonprofit for, for strip club. Yeah, sure. the, well, the, it it kind of gets there. Okay. And so I meet the director. <laughs> so so he has to come. He has to come with. I was just like, I don't think you're gonna like enjoy this part of your trip, but sure, why not? And so I'm talking to the director. We're, 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 you know, talking shop, talking about like the state of the Vietnamese American community and like the, you know, where this nonprofit is heading and all the, you know, all the services and what are the challenges and what are the things that projects that they're working on, right? It's just normal like things that I was interested at the time. And yeah. then at the end of it, he goes, so I'm pretty sure he didn't fly all the way down here just to learn about our nonprofit. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm here for his bachelor party. He's going to get married to my sister. And he goes, oh, no way. On my, on my side gig, I plan bachelor parties. What? And so we got his contact and we got into every place we wanted to for free. Wow. We were getting like free drinks and like, you know, it was crazy. I was just like, what are the odds of like that? Yeah. <laughs> God smiled on you that day. Exactly. Yeah. Wait, you know, but this dude like, was was running a nonprofit. A director of a nonprofit, right? Okay. That helps you know the local community, and he was good. Yes. And they were working on running a, a charter school at that point. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. That's a wild world down there. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Did you throw beads and see some titties down in uh, New Orleans? I did. And then when we went to, you know, you know, like the 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 the, the cliche, like go to a strip club, right? Kind of yeah. deal. I was just like, this is my first experience doing something like that. And I'm just like, we were seeing this for free for the last four days. Why did we pay? Why are we paying for this? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel uh, yeah. slightly miffed. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's darker. It's dangier. It's smoke everywhere. And I'm losing money. Like, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think most I think most American men feel weird about paying for strip clubs, but there's like a one out of I don't know, one out of ten dudes that thinks it's awesome. Does that sound to each their own, you know what I mean? That that's yeah, not my know. cup of tea. There's one out of ten guys that thinks that strip clubs is the greatest thing on earth. And the rest of us are like, eh. I don't More know power what. to them. If the, if if it wasn't that case, then they would be out of business, right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear you're a degenerate like us. Because <laughs> <laughs> we started with uh, MIT engineering yeah, and no uh, freshman high school engineering genius. And then uh, MLM. <laughs> I know, seriously, yeah. All right, so um, you took the you won the thirteen thousand, and then were you going to roll that into how you got to the hundred twenty thousand, or was that separate? Yeah, or? well, that's actually separate. So my first oh. time dabbling with like uh, the stock market was when the stock market crashed when Obama was inaugurated president. So while everyone was watching the inauguration ceremony, I was watching the stock ticker like plummet. So at that point in time, with all of like the experience leading up to that, I knew the world was on sale. I didn't know how the fuck to invest. I, I didn't know what to invest in i just knew that this was the right time so mm. i just started you know as the equivalent of throwing mud on the wall and then things were sticking so i made mm. thirty two thousand dollars in capital gains and then my financial aid got cut because of that <laughs> so, ah. then, so then i had Clearly to a rich transfer kid. out yeah so i was like so you can imagine going to the financial aid office and be like, uh, so why is it that I have to pay like the full price? And they go, well, you made 32000 in capital gains, so you can afford $20,000 in room and board and tuition. Uh. I'm like, if I'm going to pay full price, my ass is going home and I'm going to buy a new car. So I bought my sister's 350Z off of her because she became a school teacher at that time. And so she's kind of like done with the whole street racing thing. And then I transferred <laughs> to a local public school. And then that's where I did, 
you know, I studied um, for my undergrad, I studied, you know, um, uh, political science, criminal justice and Asian American studies. So I actually uh, transferred, uh, swapped over my my mechanical engineering degree, just like every other, you know, degree that tries to fulfill like the hmm. the, the the stereotype. Right. Um, but at the same time, I also didn't know I was dyslexic too. So I was wondering why I was just constantly not doing well in like the math classes. And I like understood that, but I just tried harder as like any other parent yeah. would just be like, just try harder. Work harder. And then when I failed, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when I failed my coding class, right, my first ever coding class, that's like when I was just like, I don't understand what the fuck I'm doing wrong, right? This guy's not even I'm, Asian I'm, anymore. <laughs> exactly. I lost my Asian badge at that point, right? And I just had gained it, you know, just at that point, right, in time. I, I was feeling like I was gaining it at the time. And so, yeah, because growing up, up until I would say uh, when I went to sophomore year of college, I didn't feel like I was Asian American. Actually, I didn't feel like I was Asian at all. Uh, primarily because I grew up with my uh, Dominican and Puerto Rican best friend in middle school, mm. and then all throughout that experience, uh, that was like my community. My middle school was predominantly Black and Latino, and it was one of the best middle schools in Boston. Mm. And sad story, actually, fun fact is that they're closing that same school this year, like, you know, the uh, middle schools. Because mm -hmm. the black kids and the Latino kids are doing too good? They want to close that school, or what's the... Uh... Well, it's kind of like a systemic thing. They're trying to shift the, the whole public school system in Boston to integrate into high school so that they'll go from seventh grade all the way into like uh their 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 last years in high school oh, so like i think a long it, ass high school not a correct school. yeah okay. and i went from i came from an exam school boston latin school so it's one of the best public schools in like the country and you have to take an exam to get into there so their model latin is the same too? thing a uh, little bit i don't really remember much it was just like a uh, torture this, for this dude does every, everything <laughs> yeah. yeah did you sell weed in high school no, I did not. Yeah, oh. actually, I don't even drink alcohol. <laughs> that would sadly. have been the cherry. But I probably the would smoke. <laughs> honestly, I probably would smoke weed before I drink uh, alcohol. To to be fair, I mean, yeah. so far, I think you have the answer to all of America's problems, and you can explain all the Fast and Furious movies to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, there's a fun story about that too. <laughs> so but, but when I you, digress. When you bought the 350Z from your sister, yeah. So that started you on the road of loving cars or what? The, well, uh, yeah, actually, I was a, a show car guy. So I was winning trophies and stuff like that. And then, you know, I, I, I had my own little private uh, or a little like, you know, small uh, car club. And then simultaneously, a friend of mine from high school started the largest car club in hmm. all of Massachusetts. And I don't think you can actually see it, but it says Mass Tuning right there. So now he, he literally Shout out quit to his... Mass Tuning. Exactly, yeah. Now he actually, uh, Armin actually uh, quit his job, his engineering job, to do full-time track event like organizing as his main job so you know he's living the dream there and then like my hobby just happens to just so coincide with that so um but i wasn't like a motorsports guy all the time it's just like you know what we call hard parking you just <laughs> you soup <laughs> yeah, yeah. up your car you park it and then you just like show it off right that's what that's what it is yeah so the static life as the other saying goes um <laughs> But yeah, like, you know, uh, I was, I was 21, 22 and just like, just, just driving around like, you know, uh, twisty hills and stuff like that. And that was my thing. But obviously it came with its, uh, you know, negative sides, you know, crashed a few times and things of that nature. And luckily nobody was hurt or anything mm. like that. Um, but yeah, if I had found the racetrack earlier, uh, yeah, in the racing community, man, that would have kept me out of trouble and my insurance points wouldn't be as high as they are now, <laughs> even as like a 32 year old. Yeah. When you look back, do you think like, so you spent, did you spend that 32,000 you said all on the car or did you do payments or? Uh... Oh, I mean, I, I, I. <laughs> I had to negotiate with my own sister, which is kind of <laughs> trying to rip you off, right? Yeah, it's it's like yeah. I mean the so it's funny because it's like yeah the the value of the dollar was really instilled into like all of my families. I'm like the youngest of five siblings, and I'm the only son, and so uh, uh. and there's like a six year gap between the youngest sister and me, so. Definitely, it was like kind of hard to just, like communicate and, and and really like connect with my siblings until I got much older. But 
Yeah. Long story short, you know, like, um, yeah, I, I had to, I, I bought the, the 350Z and then I used some of that money to also pay for school. And then throughout the entire time, like, you know, I, I recognize at a very young age how hard my mom and my dad was working. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I was like trying to be as independent as possible and try to make her as proud as possible because I was the black sheep in the family. So even before all the things, the accolades and stuff that you guys were praising me for, I was literally like the kid who got an F in spelling, namely because I didn't know I was dyslexic, but mm. namely also because I didn't give two rats ass too. And then, um, yeah, I, I actually got escorted by police home one, one night uh, in, middle, in middle school. And, and this is like the, the big turning point. So wow. I went to a friend's house. We played Sonic Adventure Battle 2 till like 12 o'clock at night. So the, the, the T or the, the train systems were closed at this point. And he only lived like in Southeast. So it's just one like sit, like one neighborhood away from Dorchester. So it was a straight shot home, but it was like a mile and some change. So I decided to just hoof it. So I'm walking and then all of a sudden I see a police car just like flashes lights, but no, no siren. And mm. then it stops right next to me and he goes, are you Joey? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> get in. Your mom's looking for you. I'm like, what? I was like, oh shit. Oh my God. Huh. And then, so I'm expecting like the biggest beating of my life when I get home. Cause I, I'm a latchkey kid. So like I, I, I have the keys to the house ever since like kindergarten at the keys of the house. I walk my own myself to school and I walk myself back and like mm. I would cook my own meals or like pop a hot pocket in the microwave and call it a day. Right. I had zero adult supervision at that point. Mm. So you know, I just, I just pretty much just like live to just sort of hang out and, and do whatever I want at the time. And when I got home, I saw my mom there and I was like, and she was definitely home earlier than normal. And mm. so, uh, that's why she was panicking because she didn't see me at home expecting mm. me to be there. And the one time she decides to go home to like, see me is the one time I'm not there. And oh, so, so you weren't supposed to be at your friend's house. Correct. Exactly. She okay. never knew. Right. So it's the double life kind of scenario. And so, yeah. so, it's so like, I can, I can kind of relate, but for, for our audience, uh, I think what you're describing is that your parents were working all the time. So 13 were, hours a day, seven days a week, 363 days in the year. Yeah. So that's yeah, hard the, for a lot of people to fathom is, is people working that many hours and then you got kids at home somehow. Right. Um, and, and, and yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and as like, um, you know, uh, from a kindergartner all the way to like sixth grade, I didn't understand that, right? I didn't, I didn't have that, that, that capacity to really, you know, put that together in my head. And so I always just assumed that they just like didn't want to see me, right? So, oh. uh, and, I, and I had animosity. I had like this weird feeling in my chest and I was trying to seek that validation and, and, and acceptance elsewhere from my friends, right, in particular. Mm. So as soon as I saw my mom from that point on, like I was expecting her to like yell at me or the, the, the normal, you know, spiel, right? but she actually hugged me and she hugged me really tight and actually hmm. that's the first memory i ever have of my mom ever hugging me wow yeah and and that was the catalyst at least from an like a, a an emotional standpoint that i needed then the following monday the principal of that middle school that i'm so proud to be of the timothy shout out to the timothy um she took me out of class right from right from homeroom and i never met her before and somehow she knew about what just had happened that same friday from oh. me being out at late and the police being called right and then she just grabbed me by the shirt and like pinned me against the wall and was just like what the hell are you doing huh. and i was just like in my head i was like number one who are you and number two how the hell did you find out right oh, yeah. and so but here she is to saying like, you know, your mother's uh, work, you know, your mother's worried about you, your, your parents work so hard, you know, and, 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 then, and then this is what, this is how you repay them, right? You know, this mm. is the thanks that they get. And so she, you know, she was a, you know, a, a tall, you know, uh, uh, you know, she was, uh, she was definitely like, you know, somebody that I never really identified with, you know, she's a, a black wo a woman of color. And, and then like this person never meeting me and then it's just telling me, about my own family's like trials and tribulations. And then those mm. words from her really stuck with me. You mm. know, she was just like, you know, 
like you and it, it occurred to me at that point like i got one job while while they're busting their ass so that i could have this opportunity and that is to just like go to school and just try to like be the best i can be and that's the model and the and the slogan of our middle school so from then on like that following literal following year i won state science fair first place you know uh, I got a summer job as a lab technician in Mass General Hospital, uh, and then I, I also then became a lab technician in a different department. Um, so I was in the neuro, neurology department, the microbiology department, and then I moved to the, the, um, the pediatrics GI department. And that's when I knew that, oh man, bench, or what we call like, bench lab or bench uh, research, it was not for me. Basically, like what you imagine a scientist does, like he just goes into a lab and just like- It's all for, test tubes. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And it's like, it's just like devoid of like human contact. You may see like one or two persons here and there, but outside of like, you know, my mentor- You're not uh, fucking around monkeys or anything? <laughs> uh, no, just lab rats. Lots and lots of colons from lab rats, yeah. Wait, I so was, can, I was can we just, rewind a little bit? Cause it's, it's really fascinating that you had this event of like, you went to play a fucking Sonic battle at your friend's house and came home late. And this, this moment changed your whole perspective to, I need to become super successful. I I'm realizing the sacrifice that my, that my, my mom is making. And it's, it's so strange that that happens to you as a kid, because I think most kids don't have that awareness or that, that snap of a, of a realization. You know, most kids are thinking about fucking macaroni and cheese or the next, uh, you know, the next video game or the next yeah wait how old, how old were you when this happened again uh well how old are you usually when you're like in sixth grade oh uh, i was also i can't start school late so probably right, like 12 okay. yeah. yeah 12 I, I definitely remember i was 12 because then i didn't go to the gi lab till i was 13. yeah, yeah. so you found a, a a motivating drive at an early age i think right Is that most yeah. people don't get to find well, um, I mean, it, you know, I like to always say that people are byproducts of their environment. And so, you know, like I had a lot of street smarts because quite literally like 90% of my life up until that point was just like on the streets. Mm -hmm. And then at the same token, right, uh, like uh, seeing the perspective of like my mom's, you know, uh, hustle, right, at the restaurant was like, you know, that was that was the, 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 the connection there. So combining the inspiration from my mom's hustle in the restaurant with the smarts that I had and then mm. just applying it right in yeah. any opportunity I could. So it's not like, you know, I instantly just became a science fair winner. No, it's like there was a science fair mentoring program that they were just announcing in the class. And I said, I'm going to yeah. do it. Anything that came my way, I just said, I'm going to do it. Ask my mom, can I do this? And she's like, yes. Uh, and then it just like kept going there because at that point in time, from that moment or from that, 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 that talk with my principal, yeah. my, my main drive, my main focus was to just make my mom proud, you know? Cause wow. at that point, like my, 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 my family, my siblings, they, they thought like, that I was just going to, well, there's a lot of like sayings in Vietnamese and Cantonese that pretty much are like bad, like, you know, connotations, but you know, it's like, <laughs> is, yeah. is like, basically that was like my destiny, right. To just literally pick up dog shit is what, is what they said, mm -hmm. right. To go from that point of view and just, just like have that laser beam focus. So from there on, every single thing, the, the PBS TV show, right? That was my opportunity. And then from there, I was a, you know, um, an extra in The Departed and then a stand-in actor for the movie 21. But then the acting thing interfered with my junior year. So I said, no more acting because I'm going to be a dumbass. <laughs> if I keep going None of this movie direction. shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it paid well. It was like, what, 81 an hour? It was nuts. But... Yeah. At the end of the day, right, it would have paid me then, but, you know, in dividends later, I would have retained zero knowledge or I would have failed or not get in college and stuff like that. So I, I, I had my priorities really sort of align. No, you, could have, you could have been friends with uh, Matt Damon and you could have been in uh, Downsize. Oh, I mean, I, it could, could have been Downsize, right, exactly. Um, yeah, but... It, it all paid off when when I was 17 years old, I had a conversation with my mom when we were driving in New York City 
and um she told me that i was like the the child that she trusts the most to go mm. from like the black sheep right yeah. and to, to 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 have that said to me it was so validating all the efforts that i've been going through and it yeah. just it just gave me a supreme uh motivation boost from that point on so and and i never sort of stopped that 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 drive it really just sort of became part of who i am so like I said before, like anything that came my way, I just said, yes, let's give it a shot. And so, you know, ranging from, you know, becoming a firearms instructor to pay for college and, and grad school while simultaneously like getting my degrees. And Wait, I thought and you weren't then, allowed to have guns in Massachusetts. Oh, no, we we, we, we <laughs> love our guns here in Mass. And in fact, the more <laughs> we keep making laws of restricting them, the more people want them. Right. Yeah. So. Um, but that's the thing too, is that the, 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 the navigation through firearms ownership is more robust, I would even say here mm -hmm. in mass, but some of it does actually tend to make sense. So I'm all for, I'm all for anybody being able to get whatever firearms they want with the caveat that you are satisfying the licensing and the requirements and like the training you know for those very things it's the same reason why people don't just go and drive semi trucks you need a yeah. cdl license to go do that right so it should be the same thing for different various classes of firearms that's just my well, opinion. so so what if i'm a very responsible trustworthy individual shouldn't i as an american have the right to own a bazooka a uh, bazooka i mean yes. if i were to tack on maybe like a 300 hour course and like a you know a 5000 like pay scale to do so so the same reason why machine guns legal ones are very hard to obtain because not only does the actual physical firearm itself is like 18 times more expensive than their semi automatic variant but you also need a uh, uh, F, uh, um, an ATF tax stamp that's approved. And in order for you to even get that, you need a letter from a judge that pretty much uh, validates that you are uh, authorized or, or, good, or like, you know, that there's some sort of like sane reason why you can actually own this. And no, so but that's really just the just... government oppressing me, man. Why can't I have the American <laughs> freedom to have my machine gun? You, you... You can. I, I, I personally agree <laughs> that the whole uh, judge thing is kind of erroneous, but, you know, the the idea of it just sort of being so, uh, 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 you know, out of the reach of the average person is, is the reason why, like, most people don't really necessarily go for them. So, for example, like a, a short barrel rifle, right, an SBR, has a tax stamp of $200. Of dollars. So... You can buy a short barrel rifle. You just need to pay the two hundred dollar tax stamp. But why two hundred dollars? Kind of weird. And in fact, it goes way, way back to the um, the uh, bootlegging days with um, uh, the prohibition, right? Yeah. And so two hundred dollars was a lot of money for an average American at the time. They just never updated that price scale. So now mm. all of a sudden, everybody and their grandma is rocking with a short barrel rifle, you know? So mm. so it's like it's just those things that like have to be kind of looked at with the both the intention and like. Does it actually curtail what you're trying to prevent? Can, can a civilian buy non-lethal rounds? Non-lethal rounds? Yeah, yeah, simunitions is actually pretty popular. So the irony is that we have legislations on firearms, but not that many legislations on ammunition, ironically. And as oh. civilians, we have more access to um, exotic ammunition than, mm. let's say, law enforcement or military can. So... Like, let's say, for example, a shotgun. A shotgun is yeah. really nice because it's very versatile in their ammunition types, right? Mm -hmm. You can shoot flechettes out of it. You can shoot flares out of it you, or, or ammunition that has magnesium coating so they light your target on fire. Like, you name it. You can. It's, this, it's just so broad. Incendiary. Incendiary, exactly. And so, wow. but like law enforcement and military could never do anything like that. But, you know, civilians, we have you can't full be lighting free fuckers up on the street, man. <laughs> oh, fire. I mean, oh, fire. But, but think about it. When was the last time that you saw a news report that, like, oh, man was fired with a 12 gauge shotgun and also lit his opponent on fire? You yeah. know, like, it's like, That's you wild. know, it's just, it's just, it's not that. Uh, I say once they start banning it, <laughs> that's when you're going to start seeing a bajillion people start 
like hoarding this on the black market. So okay, I just tested just Joey, and I now confirm he is also a firearms instructor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to call bullshit on all the stuff you're saying because it's incredible that you've done all this, uh, all uh, these various I mean, things. I can actually grab my my my. <laughs> No, no, we believe you. You've already He's his bazooka. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> You've displayed uh, exceeding expertise in an area where somebody who wasn't at least a gun maniac would know. But being an <laughs> instructor, you you verified your your true bona fide already. I'm yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, you know, it's also cool because like I I find myself always being in a person because I'm trying to grab you know take every opportunity that I can. I find myself in the middle of like all the different circles and centrics and communities of these different fields, right? So it gives me a nice perspective of the idea that everybody sees like certain things, objects or, or communities in a binary way. But then because I've dabbled in enough things, I can see it from all perspectives. And I can see it from in a, in a way where it's like, I can make my own opinions and I can make my own uh, judgments. And, and, and But at least I was able to uh, do it in an informed way. I think a lot of the times we live in a world where is with confirmation bias, uh, that we're very quicken uh, to just sort of um, other something that we don't understand, right? We're always afraid of things that we don't understand. And so I, I, I wanted to, in the whole journey behind why I became a firearms instructor, actually pertain from the idea that I, 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 I became self-aware of that, that I'm always afraid of things that I don't understand. So therefore, my first objective is to then go ahead and understand it. So mm. I went into a firearms basic safety course with a friend of mine who wanted to get his firearms license. And he said that guests can come in for free. And mm. I was like, if, if it's free, it's for me. I'm a fucking broke college student. So, you know, I'm <laughs> going to go. Check this shit out. <laughs> and exactly. And I go. And it was informative to an extent. But it was just like a classroom setting. And then the the guy who was like uh, issuing the classroom was like a SWAT officer. And oh. we were just like in an empty office space with like fold out tables. And there was like 40 of us crammed in this space. And he just had a projector playing to the wall. And it was just like a four hour course. And then that was it. Everybody there qualified to get like a certificate so they can go get their carry Wait, license. Wait, there was no guns in the room? There were, but there were dummy caps. So there was just yeah. like, you know, you just learn how to load, unload, and then you shot like a CO2 simulation thing on a projector, like House of the Dead type style. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's pretty much it, you nice. know? So, so I'm like scratching my head, like, really? Like, this is all there is to it? And we're one of the stricter states, right? You think that, oh, yeah, you know, Massachusetts is like, you got to go through a, sh a crap ton yeah. of stuff. So I get my carry license and I just let it sit in the in the police department and I never touched it for like six years, uh, six months until uh, I fell in love with my first firearm that I really wanted to purchase. So I go ahead and I buy a Desert gun. Eagle. Like, no, it was oh. a Caltech Sub Two Thousand. Which after four years of searching for one, I realized how much of a piece of shit it is. So <laughs> but, you know, live and learn, live and learn. Uh, you know, what, it's like what, people, what video game did you see it on that made you wanted it in real life? It, it actually wasn't even on a video game. It was just like on a YouTube web, uh, YouTube channel where like someone yeah. was showing it, and it, it's a pistol chamber carbine that folds in half. Yeah. And it accept Glock magazines. So my idea was because, you know, broke college student, I was like, I could get one <laughs> magazine type and two different guns and then yeah. be all set. I could have a carbine Smart. and a side pistol. Smart right? man, I'd be ready yes. for the zombie apocalypse. Yes. So, yeah. So, like, yeah. So that was just, like, my thought process at the time. But, you know, good idea, poor execution until they revised it to the second generation. Wait, so in a, in a zombie scenario, what is the most common ammo that we're going to be able to scavenge and loot? What are we going to find uh, laying around? Shotgun. Shotgun 12-gauge. You know, 12 gauge, maybe 10-gauge, too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do not underestimate the, the, the versatility of a shotgun. Number one, shotguns are the most cheapest guns you can actually buy. <laughs> Ironic. Yeah. Huh. Number two the the ammunition types are varied as i mentioned before and then number three is that they're due to their simplicity they will they will mo be most reliable on the field because of the manual pump action and i'm specifically referring to pump action shotguns okay um yeah so that that would be my recommendation and you can also make your own ammunition for it a little bit uh, easier without the use of uh, you know fancy presses. So I actually made my own wax slugs before, and that was a fun project. 
So yeah. Emma and I were actually looking at shotguns about <laughs> like a month oh, ago. Sh- really? So, That's oh, hilarious. Uh, I think he was looking at a pump action shotguns, I think. And then I started going down the, the route of like uh, magazine shotguns. So Oh no, no. Okay, so stay I, I away would from highly that? unrecommend it. I mean, <laughs> just as a toy, as a toy, yes, for sure. But in terms of like, you know, the the How- ability like it, it comes with the same uh, territory as like any other semi-automatic, uh, you know, magazine-fed firearm, and that is that you can have either FTEs or FTFs, right? FTEs failure to ejects or FTF failure to feeds, and with a a, a oh, plastic yeah. shell of a cartridge without like tall brass, right? You have more chances of that happening. And I so, did not like failure to eject. Well, how, <laughs> how about for shooting down drones? That, that's what we were. <laughs> drones. They're all the same. You can do that with a pump. I've hit targets at 100, 150 yards away with a rifled slug before. So, oh, a slug, like, damn. People, yeah, the, 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 the impression that's, that shotguns, right, based off of video games and, like, movies, is yeah. that shotguns are just, like, this limited range spray and pray kind of things. But because of the versatility of the ammunition types, you can do whatever you need to do. You can Dutch load your shotgun if you really wanted to. So that way, your first load is something that's further away, like a slug. If that target happens to be approaching closer, you can switch to buckshot on the next load, and then you switch to a bird shot if they get too close close or etc etc so oh this is assuming of- the zombie is moving towards you slowly well, well and- let's let's Correct, ask joey yeah. his advice <laughs> so our our <laughs> if we had enough money our dream is to buy a yeah. bunch of drones and have people fly it and then yeah. i would have a shotgun he would have have a shotgun and we would do a competition i think who could shoot <laughs> the most drones down so so, so have you heard of the, the 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 shooting sport called trap shooting and you know yeah ski trap and shooting? Ski. Yeah, I think it's a lot cheaper just to do that. <laughs> well, no, the the the, the, I, it, the idea was if we had a lot of money, like it, we're we're dreaming oh, someday. You're, we're gonna... you're flexing so hard that your ski shooting <laughs> is drones. Exactly. So when you say exactly. pull, yeah. it's like a five hundred dollar like yeah. DJ DJI Maverick exactly. that just flies over, and in four exactly. K, just gets ruined. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that you. be more fun to watch? <laughs> so it, it, I mean, to be fair. Yes, yeah. You so know, you, you, need, you need to talk to Mr. Beast on that one. He could probably fund that. So from your firearms expertise, what would you suggest for M and I? What type of shotgun would we want to do take out drones or would something would take would it be drones. Would it be something <laughs> would it be something else like a, a a standard rifle or what would you suggest? I only want incendiary rounds now. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you can get dragon's breath for that. Um I mean it depends on your budget, depends on what the purpose is, right? If you want something that's just like the the one and only gun, right? If I if I could only be told that I could have only one gun, it would be a pump action shotgun. To okay. be fair, how about for uh, a drone shooting competition? For a drone shooting competition, well, it's yeah, wild. I mean, you can't go. <laughs> There's there's two sort of dominant like uh, narratives in 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 the pump action shotgun world. One is a Mossberg 500, and the other one's a Remington. Um, and so uh, they're both like the Honda Civic and the in the Toyota Corollas of like the shotgun world. Mm. Very inexpensive, very reliable. I would go personally with the Mossberg 500 because it has a dual claw extractor system versus the Remington is only single claw. And so for reliabilities, Mossberg gets the win there. For uh, k- kind of like, uh, they both have a lot of accessories and a lot of upgrade parts for them. So Oh, yeah, I need a tack on rail on parts. my pump action. <laughs> yep, exactly, right. I've seen some pretty decked out, you know, Mossbergs. So, yeah, the, the, the sky's the limit in terms of that. And, and again, it's like... It's it's like the equivalent of like getting a, a Honda Civic and you can just soup it up the way you want to. So yeah, you can't go wrong with those two. But you know, when it comes to like accuracy, right? Sporting or or like you know, like getting like the 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 the, the fine tuned, like finely tuned machines and that, stuff like that. Those types of shotguns you want an under over uh 
uh, shotgun. So under overs, they're just, you know, they, they have two barrels that sit stacked on top of each mm. other. So they're more accurate due to that nature, right, of just their design. And that's meant for skeet shooting and all that stuff, duck hunting, whatnot. But not not my thing, not my territory. Uh, I, when I competed, I did my specialty was long distance pistol shooting, and um, uh, and then eventually I dabbled into IDPA, IPSA, uh, kind of stuff. And so, what's yeah. IDPA? IDPA is International Defense Pistol Association. So that's a type of uh, pistol action pistol competition where think of it like. Uh, John Wick level speed shooting, like the stuff that he tra- he he trained for. That's more okay. three gun, but imagine that scenario. But they try to create realistic defensive shooting scenarios. So you had to shoot behind cover, and you can ah. never expose yourself. Oh wow! Okay. You have to yeah. shoot over a window or through a window, right? You have to run yeah. behind cover, kind of deal. So, like, yeah. And so that that's the that's where it differs between like UPSA, which is like. Um, you know the three gun <laughs> stuff where they're just running and gunning and there's nothing in their way right and they just they just dump you know they just like move to mm. the next course and move to the next course and they just run around and they just shoot targets so um i, IDPA I, have, I have to tell you guys a- uh i saw a john wick movie on an airplane one time and he was <laughs> he was escaping from a nightclub and uh, uh that's probably two yeah he killed so many Actually, people yeah, I think both one he, he killed a lady in a bathtub or something first, and then he was yeah. escaping this joint, and he was, killed so many people that I had to rewind it and count. And he murdered 32 dudes on his way out, and none of them got him. Right. Um, was, I mean, you know, it's a movie, and it's it's Keanu. Yeah, but he yeah. did train with, like, one of the best people in three-gun competitions. So yeah. uh, are you guys out on the West Coast, like Cali? We're in Las Vegas. Oh, Vegas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I forget the here. name of the dude. Yeah. <laughs> I forget the dude's name, but yeah, he's a, he's a very very uh, well known um, uh, three gun coach. So, yeah, you guys have one of the best out there. Yeah, awesome. So, well, I don't think it's the cost of the drones that's stopping us. It's I'm afraid that it's such a stupidly dangerous activity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't. It can't be any more dangerous than let's say just simply flying the drones and crashing them you know what i mean because at least as long as you're shooting them in the air it's the same thing as skeet shooting so just make sure you're like yes not within civilization yeah we have a lot of desert out here we could make sure there's no range yeah it's uh it's it's but i think the moment we're trying to make it entertaining then i'm afraid are we going to do something stupid <laughs> like it's the, the idea just popped in my head we should be using like big game buffalo rounds so that uh it's overkill on the drone but then the audience will get to see us suffering with each shot oh geez on the shoulder <laughs> oh. oh man challenge accepted i'll bring my shotgun <laughs> i'll shoot a slug at a at a moving target moving like 40 miles per hour any day that's when you know you really you like nailed your your fundamentals yeah that's true when i when i do trap and skeet i feel like wow i can hit moving flying shit like this I don't know what more skill you need because I've done handgun shooting a couple times where you shoot the paper target and I go, well, I got him. He ain't going nowhere. I don't need to be one inch closer to the center. Like I got him. So Mm -hmm. to me, the trap and skeet is way more like, holy shit, I feel like I can do combat now. Right. It's very (laughs) dynamic based. Yeah. And, and, and and there's, there's practical applications to it. So, yeah. So you, you, you're, you guys are on the right, right, uh, right track. (laughs) Sort of. Thank you, Joey. I appreciate this. This, this is a great validation. <laughs> let's let's jump back to um, all a to <laughs> serious <yeah>. shit. <laughs> Your learning and research, uh, clinical clinical research. Uh, yeah, yeah. Learning so I'm in the clinical research field. So for for folks who aren't really familiar about clinical research, this is the phase in research and development of new treatments of drugs, medical devices, or therapies that actually get tested on human subjects. So they go through a phase, what we call phase zero, and there's even phases prior to that, where they do anywhere between simulation testings, right, 3D modeling, and then even animal testings to 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 be able to uh, uh, find out uh, what is the appropriate dosage that they think they can narrow it down to. So once oh. they get the FDA approval that they can go and start to conduct these tr- clinical trials, then they're going to launch the uh, their they're going to get their research protocols um, uh, IRB approved or International Review Board approved. So there's a lot of like regulations that are involved into this step. 
So once you can't just be making cr- drugs willy nilly. You gotta- Correct. And so, um, and 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 this came into question a lot, a lot during the pandemic, right? When it came yeah. to the development of the vaccine. So, I, I, I'm I'm hoping that this could be an avenue into sort of opening the eyes of folks of just how well regulated, uh, to the point that it's almost redundant. Uh, uh, this this particular field is. So once clinical trials has been approved to go ahead. The actual pharmaceutical company can't test the drugs themselves. They can't recruit patients themselves and say, hey, I want 100,000 people to go ahead and try this drug out. Yeah, you want some? And so that's a, it's a conflict of interest because that's like the tobacco company saying, we tested our cigarettes on 100 people, you know, and it's proven safe, right? You know, please sell our cigarettes. They're all very happy. Yeah, it's good for children consumption, right? Yeah. Um, so... So they have to find clinical research sites and clinical research sites could be a walk-in clinic. It could be a hospital. It could be a dedicated research center. Um, but they're the ones actually conducting the research, recruiting the patients, and they just simply sign a contract with the sponsor or the pharmaceutical company or whoever's testing, right? That says, I, I will do the job, you know, and then we'll send the data to you, right? And that's all there is. The pharmaceutical companies, the sponsors never touch a single patient. Mm. And then that's how this entire industry of clinical research is born where there's there's middlemen in between that process right and that there's a checks and balance at every step of the way there's keep, auditing keep it honest. that's constantly happening yes exactly and yeah. so yeah and then nobody deviates from the protocol nobody does their own shit nobody freestyles the research everybody follows the <laughs> same exact protocol you know from whether it's being conducted in Johannesburg or you know in you know the United States or Canada it doesn't matter the protocol stays the same so clinical research is that field and for the longest time i've been sort of in the middle of the money side of things so i negotiated budgets and contracts for clinical research sites managed the finances of 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 those particular trials and then at some point when my 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 career started shifting more towards my education background because i have a master's degree in education um it it, it then came sleep. back <laughs> yeah, what, what's going on? Yeah. I keep trying to call yeah. him out, but he just knows all this shit. I've been in school for a very long time, six and a half years. So, you know, it, I, I had to have learned something at that point. Uh, you learned everything, um, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You guys stay hungry. You guys stay curious. And Wait, so, so are you are you pro COVID vaccine? Is that what you're telling me? Well, I mean, I'm pro science in the sense that, yeah, if the vaccine is proven safe and effective, which... The funny thing is that as I'm like, I can say this now, but as like the data that I'm seeing in my field is unraveling, I was getting so excited, like, oh, this thing is going to be over in like a year and we're Mm. donezo. And then like just the pushback from the fact that we were so privileged to just have an abundance of vaccines available for folks and just people just didn't want to take it because they didn't trust it. I'm like, okay, I get it. It was a lot faster than most times because guess what? The bureaucracy was removed. The whole world of clinical research just shut down and everybody switched to that one study. So imagine the entire world focusing on Mm. one thing to test, right? And that was just an incredible thing. And the diversity in the data that we got in terms of human subjects was the most diverse in any clinical trial conducted known to man we broke a record there but nobody really cared and so it's like the idea of like this is what happens when the res- when the scientific community can come together and like we can fast track a lot of things like when we talk about like why isn't like you know xyz disease or like cancers or whatever isn't cured yet it's like because there's so much competing money there's so much competing interest right and that you know, uh, neurofibromatosis only affects 0.05% of the population, and it's just the most unsexiest disease ever. But you know, <laughs> you know, like I'm, lung I'm, disease and Joey, and heart I gotta disease. stop you, Joey. I, I can't believe I'm really confused here, man. You're trying to tell me that this vaccine is scientifically sane and it really works and it's really good, but you also really love guns and you're Asian and you're in Massachusetts, <laughs> which is kind of a democratic place. I think you're a right? Republican. I have no idea what's going on here. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I actually have no part political affiliation, but um, yeah, but, I'm yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly what you know. If 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 you think back to what I just said before, like I yeah. find myself in the middle, right? I'm always in the middle, and people always want to label me, and people always want to create put me in a box. But yeah. I mean, in general, that's how society has taught us to treat people, right? That mm. you as a person are defined by these easy categorizations that you can identify somebody, right? That the fact that, you know, like the, 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 the language that I speak most outside of like English would be like, you know, something that of Asiatic descent. But in fact, I probably speak more Spanish than I do both of my parents native, you know, mother tongues. And so, you know, it's just Sibo. one of those things where, yeah, it's like this idea that w w we have to remind ourselves, like, we can't jump to conclusions. And, and when we do that, we miss the big picture. And so, yeah, that's just like sort of like uh, what I would say to that, you know. So, you, so from the clinical research world, you're telling us that this vaccine was very well done and it's badass. And it's if you if you got half a brain, you should take it. Yeah, particularly the Moderna, and then in the in that order, then the Pfizer one, uh, because the Moderna one has the least amount of what's called adverse events, yeah. uh, and then from there, Pfizer has the best track record, and then of course you've heard it already in the news that the Janssen or the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine, you know, both has a lower uh, efficacy rate and higher rates of adverse events, and that's also true. Is there and a so, YouTube uh, thing about talking about vaccines, or do we not worry about that? What do you, oh it, yeah, oh, oh, for us that on, is true. On, on our um, yeah, you just get hit with the little, the little uh, like you know, like the COVID nineteen. <laughs> click here to learn more. Banner. You, it doesn't. They don't like censor it or anything. Okay, okay. got it. You just got to make okay. sure that you're informing folks. <laughs> yeah, if you're talking about like you know the vaccine having five G fucking chips in it or some shit, you don't <laughs> yeah. get that banner. Ah, oh, don't say that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's too late, Joe. Joe, you ruined it. All my hard work. <laughs> I exposed the conspiracy. A... Gonna silence me. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I actually joked about this with my partner at the time. Uh, like there, there were people who were so concerned about that 5G stuff, right? And I was yeah. like, man, what if I just sold people like a placebo that was just like, plug this USB drive into your computer and it'll protect you from all the 5G that's like going around. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and and people were doing that and yeah. people were making mm. money. I was like, oh man, I should have just there put were some my money people selling like a bracelet that was supposed to be like a EMF yeah. propellant bracelet or something. Yeah. And it's like it, that's happening now. Like I see ads on Facebook for like game like these e, e e gamer girls that are just like saying like yeah, just stick it in your headphone and then you know you won't get any EMF radiation or something. I'm just like, oh god. Yeah. Okay, Joe, yeah. what are you doing? Well, Lines of coke over there. Is, is that we why lost, your video's off? <laughs> we lost Joe's video feed. What? Oh, really? Oh, did it just turn it's, off? It's been off it's for like a few minutes. Oh, he's oh back. really? I thought you were doing oh, lines that, of coke. That's weird because me and me and Joe were just vibing on some EMF, you know, uh, <laughs> some conspiracy stuff. Yeah, the coke, the coke got me all EMF <laughs> out. Exactly right. They're watching it's us, a, bro. I was just putting yeah. tin foil in my underwear. <laughs> Oh, hey, Joe, I wonder if I accidentally hotkeyed it. Huh. Uh, hey Joey, out of it, out of curiosity, there's something that the way you worded it when you uh, I forget who, the when you're telling the story about uh, COVID and the testing and the results mm -hmm. and the data. There's something I forget what you the wording, but it made me think: Was there a point where you were um, skeptical at all? Was there? A, was there uh, a only from the data that AstraZeneca was putting out, and then it ended up unfolding itself. So uh, it's already in the news, so I guess there's no like negative downside to that. But um, like they were cooking their numbers uh, oh, to, to, to yeah, they were like literally saying our our uh, our vaccine with our preliminary data for like I think one or two months worth was like we're at eighty something percent, right? When in actual, in fact, it was like seventy something. And so um, what ended up happening was they basically had enough data for like three months worth, but because two months worth looked better and then when they got three months worth it it, it ruined their average right because here's a, a another mm. misconception when people talk about efficacy rate it's not like when it's 95 percent effective it's like you as an individual 95 percent of covid is like wiped out of your system right. it just means that 95 of the percent of the population 
p positively responded to it and they didn't get you know infected right so that's how it's it's it's, it's done by statistical numbers and so that's how they're determining efficacy right so when you know that right you can that that's where the the integrity part comes in because if you can just basically omit people who didn't respond from your data you suddenly have better looking numbers right and so that's actually what they did and they got in trouble for it and that's why we don't have astrazeneca as fda approved right mm. and that's how it should work you don't give us integral research we don't let your drug in our country busted i think it's pretty simple right so that's kind of how that works so that's why fda approval is like the gold standard across the world because ironically well we as americans always know that like we have this you know this like kind of like a, a a a learned learned experience of like you know the agencies of our country are a little bit bureaucratic and slow and like inefficient and not effective right but the irony of the fda hmm? i agree yeah and the fda is ironically the one thing that's like the golden standard you know, to making sure that like drugs, treatments and, and medical devices are safe and effective because they will not approve anything unless if it can st actually have some statistical significance in their in their numbers. And and there's no bias in it and there's no way that you can work your way around it. You know, I'll stick there's with no the horse pace. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah. so so Joey works in clinical research. Yeah, you are managing the finances for a clinical research. Oh, well, I, I stopped doing that. I moved to a different department. Now I just design the training for every department in my entire company. Designing training. You have a master's in education. Yeah. You studied uh, mechanical three different things. Uh, I studied um, political science, criminal justice and Asian American studies when I was an undergrad. OK, so this guy goes to school a lot. He's Killer at tests. How do I know this no, dude's I, smarter I than tests. me? Oh, I, okay. Yeah, because I didn't find out I was dyslexic until I went to my master's in education, learned about learning disabilities, and then learned about dyslexia, and then found out, oh, right. crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it sounds it. really familiar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it explains so much why I was just struggling, because this dyscalculia that I have, right, where it's like, it's a real, like, niche you know, uh, 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 form of dyslexia. And it oh. really affects me when it comes to, um, you know, math problems that have numerators and denominators, because there's a symmetry issue where my brain will flip them. Mm. And so I don't know what's up, what's down, what's left or right, um, in that regard, because then I'll lose track. And so, so are you uh, able to overcome I, that or is it still a challenge? It's something that I had to use uh, specific aids and specific um, steps in order yeah. for me to do something like that. But by that point, I was already out of the STEM field. Right. Yeah. And so that's why, like, it was such a, a, a letdown and, a dis you know, and, and something that I felt like that I wasn't able to achieve. I just mm. shied away from the STEM field. And then yeah. in my mind throughout you know internally what i was like trying to just figure out what could lead me to my next like thing was well i like helping people and so <clears throat> you know service to the community service and student government um allowed me to uh then gravitate towards political science and then you know then i worked in the city of boston and i managed a million dollars of the city's money and i and i designed a democratic process to let all the young people in Boston decide how to spend that million dollars every year, right? Mm. And vote for those projects and get to choose how to spend it, right? It's called participatory budgeting. And so it was a super cool pro process. I don't know if Boston still does it now, but you know, no, that's very un-American. We want to elect leaders to lie to us and spend the money <laughs> in secret, irresponsible ways. Right. And, and buy super yachts, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this dude's fixing cars, running businesses, Winning engineering competitions in ninth grade. Uh, yeah. Pretty Acting on TV. I didn't win. Oh, believe me, I didn't win. I'm still miffed about it, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're kicking butt in life. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like you're doing a million things, man. Do you sleep or what? <laughs> I do. It, it actually, it's funny. <laughs> I heard about it. <laughs> a, another, another thing that, that people think is really bizarre because since I don't drink or anything like that, um, I don't drink caffeine either. So like, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I wake up just like everybody else and everybody's like, I need my coffee to operate and all that stuff. And I was just like, yeah, I just need like a good solid 
six to eight hours of sleep and i think i'll be all right you know nice. why are you shaking so, your head joe <laughs> oh, look, look at this guy it's like he escaped area 51 it's like, like escape from area 51 <laughs> it's a sort of fucking experiment so, the so, government. so my my so i was actually really close like whenever i did pull pull all-nighters in college uh my secret while well, everybody else was like you doing energy drinks and all this other stuff I actually had a sour pickle, like a single serving packet of sour pickles from like the deli, mm. right? And I would just take a bite out of that every single time. And it's just like the electrolytes and the sodium and my kidneys failing just kept me up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what got me through college. Like th that's, that, that, was, that was my secret to success. And huh, so, but is, yeah. isn't that flavor similar to um, in uh, I'm I'm the vermicelli dish that the Vietnamese have, the vermicelli with vermicelli? Jelly with uh, yep. with, the, with the grilled pork, and then they have that pickled carrots and daikon. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just vinegar. You know, it's mostly just vinegar, and it's just yeah, sh shaved carrots and daikon. Um, uh, that, and would so, that would that keep you awake too, or are you talking about just the pickles? No, no. Like we're talking like straight up good old fashioned like phosphates and, and like you know uh, American. Why, why can't you believe he gets a superpower? <laughs> I believe everything a, else. I don't believe this. from a single pack pickle. <laughs> yeah, like, it's the one at the gas bad. station that comes in the juice, right? It's a, it's like one plastic. Yeah, package. exactly. That's the one. Yeah, okay. and the irony is like it's got a like you know a picture of a pickle on it, as if you don't know what the fuck is on there. So it's, like, <laughs> it's in a translucent a bag like wh why do you need to illustrate that for me <laughs> so it's a pickle or your um i'm jumping to your job your <laughs> so you you're ed you're educating you're building the education system within your company that's what you're doing yeah so like you know when people get come to a company right and you, you got to get training so um a lot of companies they start they now again realize that they need to train people at mass and as quickly as possible right to get their best rate of return so like you know in before the company was actually acquired you know i turned in my department because i was in charge of the training for my entire department i was in charge of you know interviewing you know you know hiring and training uh new hires in my department and i took the scale of like when the time frame when you get your first client from six months to down to one month and eight 1.8 months essentially in my in, in in that in the process that I had developed so that was at least impressive to the people who acquired the company so they put me on the onboarding and learning development team and then they said yeah we want you to do what you did to that team and mm -hmm. then do it to the research ops team so the research ops is the actual people the coordinators who actually do the clinical research <laughs> procedures on to patients so that's Wait, a much you, tougher are, challenge yeah are you just making people work harder uh, no, I'm actually Smarter. making people more prepared for their job and then being able to not feel because I mean, every, I don't know. If, I mean, so, most folks understand this feeling when they first enter a company, they're all excited and everything and everything seems hunky dory. And then like, then next thing you know, you're like for like a three weeks straight, you're just like twiddling your thumbs and you're just like shadowing like one person, but you still don't really understand what the heck is going on. Right. And yeah. so you know, taking the the aspects of a role, breaking it down to its core components, and then just like creating, uh, uh, you know, being able to 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 apply the learning best to the person, right? So most of the times, all of corporate sh you know training is ex almost exactly like that structure. This idea of shadowing, this idea of reading an SOP, and then assuming that you're just going to absorb it into your brain, and then off you go into the races, right? But education should not stop at school you're still learning even in the workplace you're still learning in the professional place and the only people who have learned right uh you know when people say i have six seven years worth of experience uh and they differ between the person who only has like one year of experience well guess what the person who have one year experience just only learn what the fuck they're doing in the first year you know, let alone to get that much experience. So th it's not the difference in, you know, uh, of actual experiences that they weren't given afforded the resources, nor uh, did they actually like, you know, win in the sink or swim kind of scenario. Because for the most part, people who only survive in those scenarios are either used to that type of 
level of training, right? Or they're self-starters, meaning that they ask the questions, they, they're go-getters. And then mm. to the employer, they're like, ooh, that's a good employee. And like to the employee, they're like, oh, fuck, if I don't ask the questions, they're never going to teach me. They're just going <laughs> to fail at my job. So I might as well just ask first, right? So w why not just create a standard across the board and make training uh, in any aspect, whether it be corporate, nonprofit, government, you know, uh, as 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 comprehensive as possible, but as efficient as possible, and then most importantly, tailored to the different learning needs of different folks. So hmm. instead of just giving an SOP, you're giving a training video. You're also giving a simulation simultaneously, and they do all three, right? And then hmm. and then while you're doing live training do a recording and I was doing this stuff way before COVID. So I had recordings of my trainings and documentations uh, that people could reference at all times. So uh, it was, it was, it was cutting edge at the time. And then now it's just standard Joe Schmo mm -hmm. stuff. And I just feel like, oh man, well, whatever, well, I can still do it. But luckily I still was recognized for that. And I'm really happy to be able to apply that on a more clinical sense because that is way trickier, right? How do you teach a nurse how to draw blood in a ro remote location when you yourself have never drawn blood yourself. You know what I mean? Like, oh. so I'm, I'm not going to be the subject matter expert in that aspect. I'm going to refer for the people who actually are doing that, but at least I can help them frame their training to be as efficient as possible. Cause these people want these, you know, nurses, coordinators and, and doctors or principal investigators to be up and running as quickly as possible. But you also do not want to make them skimp on the things they need to know right because that's yeah. when things can go wrong so wait so can that's you, just can you fix mm -hmm. education in our elementary schools <laughs> in elementary schools i will yeah. defer my sister for that because she's the one that used to be a principal and and she's still currently an elementary school teacher special ed uh but i specialize in you know adolescence and up you know and we to need, be we fair, need smarter kids though we need we need these kids to be doing well you need smarter kids well i mean that's that's what most like competitive schools do they just cream their kids and then they just pat themselves on the back when they say oh look at their test scores they're so high it's like well you just fucking recruited the spartans out of the group and then left everyone <laughs> by the wayside yeah the way i evaluate education is that if you can get the 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 students who everybody have given up on already yeah, and then yeah. they improve themselves to an ability that nobody else thought they could possibly get. That's when I say that you were a great teacher. That's when I said that your education system is the bomb and that your system is really, really dope. So that's the, the, the main like, you know, criteria that I hold is not, you know, where you're at is where you were and how, how much of a gap that you close. Um, and that's how I evaluate, you know, what good teaching, what good education systems really look like. Through all, through all your jobs, and I get, it sounds like you had a bunch of jobs, um, what advice would you have for someone like kind of starting out in life? Uh, don't be afraid if you don't know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually just uh, spoke uh, at like a virtual event for my high school, and, um, and it was really good to actually hear this, you know, confirmed and validated and appreciated by the students themselves. When I had said, you know, similar story that I just told, told to you guys and then being able to give them like, you know, my two cents because, and it's great that you asked this question because it's so hard to, you know, retain a lot of the information, especially since we're going, what, we're going through three hours of this. And if I were to say to anybody, if you learned anything, it'd be these few sayings that I have. So I live my life by a lot of like mottos and a lot of um, like sayings. And one of them is that, um, you know, uh, you know, I already said it, you're, you, people are byproducts of their environment. So when you recognize that from the perspective of, of that, if somebody pisses you off or somebody is like a grouch or, or an ass to you, like you may think about sort of what their circumstances were at the time. And then it kind of gives you a little chill pill to say like, I don't know what that person's life was like. So I'm just going to like kind of cast that aside. Mm. But for career stuff, you are not bound by, you are not bound uh, by blood to your job. That was said to me by a good friend of mine from the car scene. And he was a, a mechanic at a Toyota dealership. And so, you know, like, um, one of the coolest guys I've ever met and shout out to Keon, if you ever watched Keon. this, mm -hmm. what up, Keon? And so, 
yeah, that just, really changed my perspective because I was at that point just like stuck in a job that I just didn't like at the time. But, you know, I was doing it because it paid the bill. Right. Or I was just like, you know, really like frustrated with the politics of everything. Um, so, yeah. So you're not bound by blood. Does by Keon still work at Toyota? Uh, he's in D.C. now. I know that he probably still does something in working on cars, but um, not sure if it's to Toyota still. Um, <laughs> We had a bomb GT4 that he built uh, by scratch, you know, and so, nice. yeah. The, um, let's see. What else? Oh, man, I had so many, and I've jotted them all down for that event. But, you know, when it Don't when rely it on coffee to, to start your day. <laughs> right, exactly. No, no. Eat more pickles. So you're not perfect is what you're saying. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I never said it. I was. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, saying you are. <laughs> right. saying he's impressive, but... My Ladies and gentlemen, sucks. we got him. <laughs> yeah, you got Sucker. me. Okay, done. Interview over. Yeah. So uh, uh, something yeah. that uh, touched me earlier when you're talking about, because um, I'm Vietnamese and then Emmett's half Vietnamese. Um, I like pickles. <laughs> for me, for me, growing up uh, Vietnamese American, having yellow skin that's very obvious to a white American. Right being treated differently, especially in the job at a job where my pay raises have not kept up with my white counterparts. Uh, some of the things right. that you said about your parents working 13 hours a day, seven days a week, 363 days a year, 63 days. Yeah. There, I mean, I see there's certain similar uh, similarities in a lot of the Asian American stories. Um, not to, I'm not, I'm actually not saying, I'm not trying to say that to just <laughs> credit average you. Vietnamese not, dude. Yeah. Not your, <laughs> I think the way that you're able to tell your story right. is, is heart touching in my opinion for me, because I, me being raised, my mom was very harsh on me. My parents, my dad and mom were very harsh on me. Um, I, it wasn't until I was much older that I knew that my dad was working three jobs. I didn't know he was working three jobs at one point. Wow. Um, I think my mom had two jobs at one point. Um, I don't remember, but, uh, but interestingly, when you mentioned that, when your mom hugged you when you were 13, that was the first time you remembered affection from your parent, from your mom. Like yeah. I, I feel 12, like actually, yeah, I feel like I didn't really have that affection. So I grew up kind of resentful at mm. life. Not at, not really at her, just at Correct. life yep. trying to deal with, with it, trying to figure out why did, you know, I go through high school. I worked hard at through uh, college and then my pay grade is not, where my white counterparts are, uh, it was always mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thirty to forty percent less. Um, Damn. But well, you, you never got the hug. <laughs> no, not that I remember. I don't I think don't, a hug would have solved the thirty to forty percent <laughs> pay gap. But to start, <laughs> the, the, what would have been interesting if if there was the affection? I don't know. I'm just this is an emotional thought. No, here. no. Yeah, if kidding. maybe if I did have the the affection, maybe I would have grown up and not cared about that forty percent mm, pay gap as mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. Because I know that I spend a lot of my time nowadays saying thank you to a lot of the people that were in my past, uh, whether it be my Aunt mm -hmm. Elvia, who I, I haven't talked to for like 10 years, but or prior, there was a big gap where we didn't talk to each other, do the family drama and whatnot. But when I remembered some of the stuff, I said, Aunt Elvia, thank you so much for giving me those hugs when I was 12 years old. That was a life-changing moment for me. Mm -hmm. I was able to mm -hmm. treat my my friends and family and girlfriends better because I had that affection, but yet I mm, had the affection like from that. an, from an aunt, but then I didn't have it from my mom. I'm not trying to throw my mom right. under the bus. My mom worked two jobs. She right, was right, a single right. mother. Um, there was a lot of challenges for her, but these are the stories that I think yeah. a, a lot of people don't get to hear. Like I, unfortunately, I guess lately I feel a lot of, um, stereotypes from, from almost white racism or racism from white people towards Asians. No, I'm not saying that I feel it all the time. I just, there's subtleties when I talk to certain people and they just, they label us Asians as other or something like that. And they don't want, they want to lump, lump the story into, oh, that's what the Asians went through. There is the Vietnam War or whatever. That's what they went through. But they don't, there's no empathy there. And that, that really bothers Correct. me. But Anyways, I sorry, I'm going on a tangent. I think I really yeah, appreciate no, your no, story. No, no, that is super, super, 100. percent And actually, I, I, I 100 percent resonate with that. And you know, like it, 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 it we're, it's, it's, it's also like, um, 
what's it called relieving to know that you you didn't you didn't experience that alone right that 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 this is not you're not the exception you're the rule and so you know number one parents are just doing the best that they can with the resources that they're given right you know it's not like that they our parents had the luxury of going to like oh make sure you hug your kid you know in this american paradigm day right it's like you know they they they're just worried about when the next meal and the rent was going to be right and so yeah and 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 then the other thing is that and and this goes back to the ideas of the sayings is like it takes a village to raise a child and so the fact that you got that 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 support from your aunt right is is exactly how i felt like i got it from my my latinx you know community and my like adopted family right mm -hmm. that i learned affection i learned the you know the, the 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 that level of like care and understanding and like warming embrace from a different community and a different from a different culture than mine that so much at the time I resented the Asian identity that I was labeled with, right? That I came from because it was not that, right? I go to, I go to Jonathan, my best friend's place. And like, you know, his mom is just like greeting me with, you know, hugs and kisses. Right. And then like, that's, that's, a, that's it. And like the culture was just full of like love and full of fun and full of dancing and music. And that's not what we're coming from. Right. The idea. Right. Yeah. And so that's why growing up, it was so hard for me to have an Asian identity, um, you know, too. And so it's, it's actually been studied and there's uh, it's called the, the uh, minority identity uh, development theory. And that is in the first stage, you conform to what you're being told that what is the stereotypes or what are, what are the things that we're supposed to be doing. And then the second phase is that there's just this resentment towards us, this, this, this othering. Why? Because we have been oppressed in the idea that those other things are negative things, right? Asian food is nasty. Asian people are not desirable. Asian men are not desirable, right? The emasculation of uh, East Asian and East Southeast Asian men and South Asian men and all that stuff. And so um, then you start to hate yourself because of it, right? So then there's another uh, model that's called the four I's, right? Institution, uh, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and then in an individual level. So when you when it gets down to the individual level, you start to self hate yourself as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And then the third phase is like when you finally realize that you know it's white supremacy that makes you hate yourself for, as a result of that. And then you start to then you know real come to realize okay these oppressive ideas come from these reins reins reinforced stereotypes both in Hollywood, uh, in media, in 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 institutions, in government, in leadership, right, in opportunities, and so um, in dating shit, right. And so like, those are the things that, that, you know, gives you, those are some models and some tools that help allow you to frame, uh, understand that framework so that that way you can sort of learn to be like, okay, this is an uphill battle. I'm player one, but I'm amongst many other players on my team and we need to get through this. Right. And then there's two ways to go about this. You either like fuck shit up or that you try to work your <laughs> way in the system and reverse it from within. So those are the two ways in which, you know, you, you can go about that, but you know, pick your poison in that regard. So, yeah, I mean, I teach those concepts, right? I, I when I learned it in college and I teach them to young people when I was serving in AmeriCorps uh, uh, for a year and I was leading Chalk like a bunch one. of young Asian. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and you know you're teaching um, you know high school students right you know this this framework and it, it unlocks with them I can see it in their eyes I can see it in their behaviors and I can see it in the in their attitudes that it changes once you give them those 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 paradigms because they know they exist in that world but they can't put they can't put a finger to it they can't name it they can't um, you know, uh, 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 actualize it. And, and they definitely don't have the tools to be able to, to, to challenge it. So mm -hmm. when you, or, 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 or be able to, to address it. And so, um, yeah. And it just sucks because like, you know, that's why like Asian American studies has been so important to me because it allowed me to first unravel the hate that I had for my Asian American identity. And then two, embrace it and then three now understand that my community is just as you know well, not just as but also is 
oppressed, right? That 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 my you know that that paradigm shift goes from I wanted to focus on helping the Latinx community in the Boston and the Massachusetts area to now I also need I want to help both the Asian American community, the Latinx community, the African American community, and every every pretty much marginalized community out there. And that if we pool our resources and we pool our efforts together, we can we can really make some good change here. You know. Wait, what about so the that's, Irish people that's, in Boston? The Irish folks, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it depends on what you're referring to. So <laughs> talking about like the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth generation <laughs> Irish Americans and Irish Italians are here in Boston. They'll be aight. They'll be <laughs> yeah. Wait, hold on, hold on one second, one second. You just mentioned, I, I just realized you were in Boston. You mentioned this earlier. Did they film The Departed in Boston? Yes, they did. And you were an extra in it? Yeah, they actually filmed. Yeah, me and my brother-in-law, we were extras. You'll see him in a split second of the f of the movie itself. I'm not in the shot. Yeah. Wow. And then in the movie 21. Huh? But you got paid yeah, to show up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was a cool experience. Yeah, it was a cool experience. We actually got to eat the food that the actors got to eat because they ran out of box lunches. Nice. Uh, and so... Like they just shoot us over to that table and they just said like just don't tell anybody that we let you in and then <laughs> we got to see matt damon uh um did you fucking, get to see marty uh, was he there yeah he marky mark yeah no, no, I mean, no Mar Mar or martin scorsese martin scorsese no uh -huh. um but we did i did see jack nicholson and um what's it called you ever you know that movie anger management where he has that fucking like electro thing on his head and he like you know like basically stimulates his follicles with it <laughs> yeah it's a very niche thing in that in that movie but he has that in real life is so, that how he gets the freezing like i can't tell wow i don't know but that like I can't tell now if that that's something that he just took from the set and just said, I'm keeping this, I'm going to use <laughs> this shit. Is legit. Or like that, that is his own thing. And in that movie, he's just like, yo, I got this hair follicle thing. Maybe I'll just do this because this is my normal routine anyways. Can you just film me? And the director's like, yeah, sure. Knock yourself out. And so it's just fucking crazy. Yeah. The, the different things in there. Uh, yeah. Jumping, jumping back uh, to the Asian identity thing. I, I grew up, uh, I was raised at a high school and a, well, elementary, junior high and high school where it was like 98% white people. And I was one of the few Asians. So the mm -hmm. identity crisis was real. It was, it was tough. It was, uh, for me, luckily I'm, I'm obnoxiously loud and maybe because of yeah. that, because of that situation, right. it caused me to be, yeah. to create a very strong personality. And I was, I feel like I was able to overcome it. But then I, I remember like the four other Asians, when I look at them, I'm like, damn, that must be tough for them. The four other Asians. Yeah, yeah. You were, you were the A5, the Asian five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear but, that. But you didn't you know, go out of your I, way to hang out with the other Asian kids, right? I Well, when when um, Joey's talking about uh, the, the way you worded it, where you, you hate yourself because you're not a part of right. the majority. Mm -hmm. So what I did right. do is I, I kept a distance from all of them, including my own brother mm -hmm. yeah. at school. I, I yeah. stayed away from anybody that was Asian. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, yeah. I, I hear that. Until I was a junior in high school. Then I dated an Asian. The one, one of the other four Asians was a girl and I dated her. But that's because the emasculate, emasculation of men. Mm -hmm. I actually, oh, mm -hmm. I dated a, a, a white girl. She, couple white girls but but it was easier to get <laughs> seven with, it was easier to get with the asian girl than um not to call her easy that but, no, it, you but get there's all this at. there's all the social pressure yeah. because if if you're in a white school and you're a white girl how much pressure are you can get for dating the oh, asian yeah. guy yeah right? yeah how yeah. uh because people do think about that right mm -hmm. how everybody sees them and, and what's their position in the correct world. yeah exactly I've, yeah i've dated two girls where i felt like at the end of the relationship it, uh it was two white girls separate uh it was actually when i one when i was like uh 20 26 years old and the other one when i was 36 mm -hmm. and both girls when they broke up i i try to ask them what what's wrong what why are we break why do you want to break up but it i i can't confirm it because they didn't say it but there was something in their answer that made me feel like <laughs> oh 
Like they couldn't be. <laughs> Joey's with an, feeling your pain right now. They couldn't be with an Asian guy or something. The I think the first girl, I feel like her parents are pushing her to stay with, to go with a white guy because of their culture. But the second Damn. girl, I'm not really sure what that was. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's ever yeah. or needs to be explicit. But I think in in every gal's mind, there's there's this image of where's the future of this, right? And and does this person fit into my mm-hmm. the ideal of what I think needs to fit there? And if it doesn't look like everybody else, mm-hmm. then I I can't move forward being different from everybody else because I'm in a family, I'm right. in a community, I'm in a church, I'm in a and everybody sees me everywhere. And how does this person fit into my life? Will I have acceptance exactly. from, from my parents? Will I have acceptance from my peers and, and the other gals? You know, well, I look funny at the wedding when I'm trying to catch the bouquet, you know? It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and those are all like things that like when I talked about the, the, the minority identity development theory, right? It's like, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not just you experiencing it, right? right? Mm. Other people are also experience it. Other people are conforming to what society is telling them to do. And then, and then the society is family included and family probably be being even more bigger pressure. So, you know, it's those things that, so yeah, I mean like, exactly. So, you know, for, for our listening podcast audience, school, uh, Joey has smoothly yeah. uh, changed his zoom background to the Brady Bunch. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so all throughout like growing up and dating in middle school and high school, like I I I can I like I subscribed to like that pimp mentality because I wanted to really prove to myself that I was desirable, that I was all this other stuff, right? So that affected how I treated women or and girls, you know, like, you know, all throughout both my platonic and romantic relationships. And, you know, I I those are the things I do regret because of the harm that I had to, uh, caused to them, right? Um, and and at the same time, like Wait, were this you is slapping the hose or what? Of, were you slapping hoes? No, or I mean it's it's just like the idea of like this, you know, if I, if if like they they if I just if they just didn't appeal or like I was like I don't know, a bad way to say it, but it's just like you know I was just moving on. I was just like moving on to the next person, right? And trying to like put a notch in my a, another notch in my belt, right? Mm-hmm. And and so that 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 causes you know a lot of harm, and 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 you know that stayed with me even into college. And you know there are a lot of you know great great folks that great partners that I've had that you know that that were um, did nothing but you know provide me love and provide me affection and all that stuff and i just r- took that for granted as a result of this idea that i'm trying to chase after this idea of like i need to you know upgrade or i need to you know get with somebody who is more this idea that it proves that i'm like a badass because i'm with her kind of deal like i you know like i i got in a relationship with her kind of deal so yeah, it, it really it messes you up and it messes your you know the idea of like how you treat you know romantic partners uh, in that dynamic, right? And I'm not saying that you know the emasculation of Asian men is the sole cause of it, right? It's also like society like teaching me that like being a pimp is a good thing, right? Be, I wonder what kind of music you were like, listening to I- in those days. Oh yeah, like you know, Lloyd Banks, Fifty Cent, you know. Um, oh, Lloyd Banks. That's uh, I've what's heard it called? Uh, Ch- Chameleonaire was like my favorite yeah. rapper growing up, you know. And so, like, it's this idea: is like get money, right? Get money, power, respect, you know. Get that money, kind of get stuff, bitches. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's my anthem. And and, 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 and it's, it, <laughs> you know. And, and it's good to like listen to it as like a kind of like a uh, an homage, is. right? But the, oh, okay. But, but but it's the idea of like you know like uh, understanding when I listen to some of it, I go, ooh, that did not age well. Wait, <laughs> like, so you, you know what I mean? Like, are you saying you had so, uh, so as a young man you didn't have great healthy relationships, and that your struggles in in growing up were not aided by the type of music you were listening to? Is that a fair summation? The, wait. The, the struggles that I was... You, you oh, me, wait, say that again? Sorry. Let me try to... I'm going to try to answer, and then uh, <laughs> it might make the question more clear, maybe. So I'm thinking... <laughs> Got that, it. I feel like often we humans are seeking comfort, and we're not seeking 
to be different just to be different. Meaning, so if if Joey, I'm 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 answering for you, Joey, and you could say if this is wrong later. <laughs> I'm just I'm guessing. Okay. So what, Joey? No worries. Go I'm, for I'm, it. I'm probably. I mean, I'm probably answering for me because I went through some of it. Yeah. When you have an identity crisis of being a minority and trying to fit in because this white group is stronger, bigger, bigger, stronger in every way, economically, physically, yeah, so everything. Mm-hmm. So privilege that, wise, that causes you as a human to, you kind of are more destructive and without you knowing it, but you're being a loud mouth. You're being, you're being obnoxious. You're trying to compensate for the situation. So Mm -hmm. listening to music is a reflection of who you are. It's not the music is making who you are. You are Mm. seeking something of comfort through music. So the problems that, that are created were created way before created systemically through, Mm -hmm. Whether it be colonization, economics through white people, whatever it is, whatever problem Joey or I had, I'm guessing he was seeking music as a comfort. So does that does that answer your question, Emma? And Joey, does it it, sound kind of close? Well, let let me hear if that's like what the question (laughs) that he was throwing at. In Joey's younger life, as he was exploring dating and relationships, he left a trail of broken hearts because somewhere he got the idea that pimping and conquering <laughs> bitches was the way to go. Is that- I mean, yeah, that kind of sum, sums it up, right? <laughs> and then, like, you know, be, being heavily influenced in, like, Latinx culture. And Latinx culture is, like, for, and particularly has a big problem with, like, machismo and masculin- toxic masculinity and all that stuff. So, I, 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 as a byproduct, I inherited that shit, too, right? Yeah. So, coming with it, right, It's it's it, it comes full circle. It's not that the music makes the problems right uh become come to fruition it that it just reinforces it right that if it's yeah. the glorification in this music video is that the desirability is you know the the guy with the biggest chain and all the women surrounding him then i gotta get the biggest chain and all the women surrounding me like a role right? model and so exactly but yeah. i think the problem yeah. is the problem already existed i know yeah uh, it already also, existed. It just re- it just reinforces. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. But what here? Here's a weird. So hypothetically, if you were in the same world, but we had like a multiverse, right? What if instead of gangster rap, like the Beach Boys was the hot shit, and you were like, man, this Beach Boys music is great. I'm gonna have a steady girlfriend, and I'm gonna give her my jacket, I, and we're gonna. I go mean, for, I mean, even we're gonna go for a ride even, in the even, convertible. To be fair, to be fair, that's still there's some levels of that that's problematic too. Even the Beatles had problematic music too, right? So yeah. there's it's it's um it's what they call right uh art uh, uh imitating life, right? That's all it is. Yeah. And so you know when it boils down to it, it's that the idea that you know that um men are entitled to women, and then women like have to fall in line with this idea that we're hitting on them, and it makes them uncomfortable. But guess what? That's just what society is saying that you just have to go with that kind of shit so that i subscribe to right that i had sadly benefited from right and then Mm. the vice versa people have had harm as a result of my actions and so those are the things that you know when i'm trying to uh you know grow as a person and like when i you know uh you know console with like you know my my uh you know my friends that i made in my men's group you know it's like the idea is that we want to now redefine what that means, mas- what, what masculinity means to us, and then what are the values that we want to uh, be able to emulate, and then what do we want to impart and share for other men too, to be, make men be better men, right? And so then then you can reframe what is the cool stuff, right? And and it's cool that popular culture and music and, and media is starting to take shape of that and starting to really make that popular and desirable and when i talk to young folks even my cousins right now like they they get it they get the idea and those are the things that i didn't learn till like post college i didn't learn mm. until i was in more um nonprofit uh spaces and things of that nature and i didn't learn that until i sought therapy and all that other stuff so it's it's one of those things where it's like does it have to get to that point in time for you to realize how to not be a dick right 
it's mm. like that level of education that level of like decency and humanity and in particular for us men to be able to uh well i'm just assuming uh the gender identities at this point but for men in general <laughs> i always assume gender to, identities <laughs> yes right, yeah to, to just to just be able to just say like this this should start you know as early as possible right and it goes back to the idea that it takes a village to raise a child and that we're byproducts of our environment. And, and so um, we need to now take that ownership and be part of that environment that can shape it the way we want it to be. What if we're getting too soft and we're just feeling our feelings all the time and I need therapy and I can't get anything done and I have anxiety and I, I, I don't want to work. Oh my well, God. I, 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 I want to point well, out one thing about therapy too, is that like, like anything else ther therapy, is no different than going to the gym or doing preventative maintenance right. on your car. It, your, your mind exactly. isn't perfect and it needs help also. You know, there's, I, there, I feel like there's a lot of stigma even still to this day. I mean, it's getting better against therapy as being like, you know, a sign of weakness or a sign of, you Correct. know, admitting that you're broken. But I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that therapy is, even if you, I think that people that don't think they need therapy probably need it more than anyone else because. Yeah, no kidding. No, I'm like, smarter exactly. than the therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and, no. and that's okay, right? And that's yeah. okay because, because yeah, and and just to piggyback off of Joe, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 the idea that we are in a point in crossroads that we can design and shape what we can define. You know what what is considered masculine what is considered feminine and then in, in in this case right it the lines become so blurred at this point it's just like what does it just mean to just be a human at this point right and so um when we t when you when you mentioned the idea of being too soft right too uh emotional all that stuff right when you're saying all those those things you say yeah. it in a negative context as if it's something that it is negative right and where does that negative context usually always has like a you know the 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 bipolarization of if you're not saying it's not masculine and you're too much of this, then it's what feminine, right? So therefore, we've already, as a society, created that binary kind of perspective. Yeah, already. I'm, I'm not even talking but, about gender though. I'm I'm kind of worried that uh, are we as a nation becoming a bunch of ineffective, non-productive people? Is is there a ton of people around not doing something useful? Or worthwhile. I get that. And and that comes from the idea that, you know, people need to have utilitarian use. And in fact, like an external factor, right, of like why, like, you know, I hustle so fucking hard is like this idea that I, I still have this thing that I that I they have to combat all the time. It's like mm -hmm. I have to be useful in some shape or form. Even when I go visit a friend's place, I'm always yeah. like, hey, can I help you with that? Right. I just feel yeah. awkward if I don't feel like I'm just going to sit there and stand there and be a, 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 a spectator versus a participant or some some way in contributing because yeah. you know our society teaches us that it's like if you're not if you're not helping you're you're detracting and it's like well, no, well that's what i'm worried about also, is that we don't have that i'm afraid we have all these detractors it's it's a it's it's definitely a paradigm it's definitely a a perspective in which to look at it but yeah. then we also can also say that we are so worked up into the idea of that we need to do something right that the act of doing is more valuable than the human being behind it mm. and that if you don't fix but 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 what it doesn't say is that if you don't fix what the human being behind it is then ultimately that person when they do snap when they do not like you know say call it quits or or or, or something even more irreversible happens you go ah oh, they were just crazy you know, they they were just you know they 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 were always like or they go I never knew that right there are some high functioning people who are literally like one like incident away from going postal right but right here, if they right just here. literally <laughs> just sat down and... <laughs> yeah yeah the, the 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 marks on your beanie is how many bodies the body count right <laughs> yeah hey man maybe right? give me some shooting lessons sometime so, you know no 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 it's five days without incident right five days like the homer simpson thing in the, in the nuclear power plant oh, five right, days right. with no yeah. incident yep. uh, you're gonna ruin that streak yeah hypothetically so, I wonder... yeah I wonder to Emmett's point, I wonder if that's the future that we all are in because of, so we got computers, we got cell phones, we got conveniences of Uber driving food to your house. We got 
cars that go 130 miles per hour. We have trucks that have uh, two two feet of suspension. Tra- was it two feet? Is your or whatever. Uh, you Four, all this, yeah. yeah, whatever. 14 <laughs> oh my inches God, of, you drive one of those? <laughs> <laughs> so I, know how you drive, I have not run sorry, over sorry, any sorry, children. Liam. <laughs> so, sorry, Liam. So I, Hopefully I think, it doesn't have the Carolina lean. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about this, we'll talk about this offline. <laughs> so I think yeah. this is the, the future that we are moving towards, and it's moving much faster than anyone could have ever predicted, and we are creating our own problems at the same time. Whether I don't know if it's right or wrong. I actually do think we are going... I think the pendulum is swinging in a way that will cause for right for the right thing to happen morally in the end. But that's just my theory. Uh, when you're mm-hmm. saying if we're too soft as people and we're not producing enough, I theorize the big corporations and the governments have been uh, have been kind of taking too much out of people and not giving enough back to people, and people are realizing that. So there, there's a there's a there's just a fight. Going back yeah. and forth on that. And right. I think the pendulum is moving. Equal and opposite reaction, right? Oh, yeah. God. This guy probably wants people to have a livable wage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Maybe well, no, right. well, but Communist. You know, because, you know, pissing in a bottle is just, you know, not, not good enough. Oh, why is it always Amazon? Amazon, Jeff Bezos. Do we have the Jeff Bezos right. head anywhere still? Uh, oh, God, do you guys really have one? <laughs> no, we had a Jeff Bezos oh, sure. big head print out, but it's not, it's not that big. It's. Well, that's still pretty hilarious. I want to see it. <laughs> Emmett's got it. But but yeah, but I I agreed. I I, I oh actually. Oh my god! <laughs> nice. You need to keep All that right. handy for this podcast. Nice. I'm surprised it's the first time I've seen it. Exactly. These. No, well, so here, look, we were I'm telling, coming for you, Jeff. Yeah. We, we we grew up in different times. Like we had parents that were working so much that uh, we came home from school by ourselves, right? So you, I had a key. Right. I let myself so, in the door, cook your food out of the kitchen, figure it out, right? and you're walking home from school or walking home from the bus today, I don't think any kid walks home unattended. Like I drive around, I'm a realtor, so I'm driving around town to neighborhoods all the time at all hours of the day Mm -hmm. and drive past any school. There's 300 cars waiting to pick these kids up. But what that also means is 300 people ain't doing shit. This is the important thing they're doing today is sitting here waiting for the kid and they got there early so they could be further ahead in the line which meant they showed up like two hours before school's out and well, they're sitting in their well, car. So I, I, I would propose a counter argument to that, or I guess an augmented argument to that. Yeah. As the society progresses, less and less people have to work in general. Yeah, but what I'm you saying know? is if, if it was a tougher time back then, it made it for tougher back people. Back then? Yeah, no, that wouldn't have worked. Yeah, well, I'm saying it was tougher back then and it's easier now. Has it gotten so easy that we're a bunch of soft, well, useless people? But that's good, though. The fact that it's so easy... I think reflects on the fact that our society has made it easy. You know, I, we I should I be getting more world. educated and more capable and more amazing. We shouldn't be getting stupider and dumber and useless. Well, that there, there's 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 validity in all those statements, right? And and the, <laughs> I just and the indicted one thing all of the, America. Yeah. And, and the not, one thing to, to yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Joe. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna make a stupid joke. Yeah. Go ahead, <laughs> it's ruined. <now. laughs> I ruined it myself. Don't worry. Go ahead. Uh, well, there's a validity in all of that, and and the thing is, is that is as you know, we go back to you know what was said before about this idea of like the 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 forces, right? Is that it's an adaptation uh, thing that is sort of going on. It's a reaction to sort of like what society that we're in, right? In that um, when we talk about the idea, uh, when you're saying like, oh, like you you're seeing people pick up their kids from schools and stuff like that, well. You know, it's a reaction. It's a reaction to the the idea that you know my kid is not safe. So therefore, I, my reaction to it is that I'm just going to bring them home. So that way, there's no way that they're going to get into another school shooting kind of situation, right? Meanwhile, school shootings was never in the paradigm back in you know in the '90s or at least early '90s uh, and, and, and before, right? But yet, you know, and then snowball into the other ideas of like. You know, with the idea of of, of wait, work, are you saying right? all these parents um, are packing heat in the uh, pickup line? <laughs> I mean, well, they, they, can't, about it. They, they, they can't because the irony is that in the school zones is a no end zone, so you know okay. nobody could actually stop a school shooter if they wanted to. Oh, right. I mean, the Just school saying. shooter will see that sign and be like, "Damn it, not damn today. it!" Exactly. It's like, yeah. I, oh, come on, this foiled my yeah, plan. Dude. Yeah, exactly. that sign is one hundred percent effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, our our, so, our big problem in America is obesity, right? Well, I mean that that too. Like so, so the the thing We're is, soft, that, like, we, want to, we 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 want Literally technology, soft. right? 
We, we, <laughs> right. we want technology. <laughs> we we appreciate and we're you know really drawn to the conveniences that technology gives us. But the irony of it all too is that technology makes us more productive than we could have ever been in the '90s, ever been in the '80s, and we're out producing. You know, we're out producing our you know decades ago counterparts because of that with maybe time to spare right yep. if yep. if that is case if mm -hmm. you're still the same hustler hard worker now you're producing 10 times the output and then when you become the model employee as a result of it and everybody else has to fall suit right then suddenly now everybody still work to death but they're also not lifting a single finger in us in a sense right and then they they they're getting you know they're, they're they're all the health problems that come with that come in so you're working harder you're getting a more unhealthier and then at the same token maybe you're not getting paid as much because due to inflation you didn't really outpace inflation so there's a lot of factors that go into that to the regard and right. you know if if a reaction to that is that like I didn't have health care and then I'm going through a mental, you know, I'm going through an, uh, 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 an anxiety attack and then a breakdown and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm, I can't get a job because I'm too scared to like figure out what the hell is going on. Right. And that's like the most extreme case. And, and I would really shy away from the idea that that, that particular, you know, extreme case is like, all of young people all of this generations of certain or, or groups of folks because you know quite frankly there's a little bit of that in us in every single person we're just better at hiding it mm. we're just better at being more high functional while living with it right i'm um, hiding my and, softness and by it, being productive and tough it's not about softness it's about <laughs> just the idea of that you're you're not you're you're not addressing the things that really are going on right and 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 it it varies between person somebody could go through ptsd and never have it addressed right and ptsd ranges from the person who is the the combat veteran that came home to the person that was molested as a child to the person that saw a loved one get you know uh, uh get taken away from them or or or, or such and then, and then they're told by society, you, you got to keep going, you got to keep moving. Mm. And then it's like, you know, there's no, there's no pause button. There's no, there's no societal button that says we value the idea that you need to just get your shit taken care of internally as a human being with your family. And then, yeah. then when you're ready, go back out there and kick some ass. Oh yeah. But I like getting to the kick and ass part. I feel like a lot of people get stuck in the, I'm not capable. I'm just going to. Not everybody not everybody can make it, you know, like latchkey kids. It, do, it doesn't mean that the, the byproduct of like latchkey kids or people who become very independent. This is a phenomenon called kid dulting, right? Mm. Kid dulting can happen in very various um, uh, reasons, be it like dysfunction in the family. So then the kids have to then go ahead and you know, raise their own siblings, right? And be mm. the caretaker, sometimes be the breadwinner in the family. And then and then they they they, they don't catch a break. My dad was the same way when he lost his father back in Vietnam. And from 11 to 17, he worked at the, 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 the freaking, uh, the tailor that his mom worked at. And mm. then all he wanted to do was just get away. So he found a job as a truck driver. And then from 17 on, he had that freedom, but at least he was bringing home the bacon. So it satisfied that aspect. So that's why I'm you know, his mom was okay with that. And so those are the, but then, I, I, but then we talk about like values, like he, you know, he didn't, he had as much of a, uh, as, as much of a, a middle school education, right. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time that they were, by the time that he had to go back to work. And so he never was afforded that opportunity. And, you know, when we talk about dealing with emotions, I just lost my grandma. Like literally she passed away last week and mm -hmm. he was Sorry just, yeah. thank you. Um, Sorry about uh, that, man. She's all the way out in Vietnam, and he visited her for a month, and he couldn't even see her because she literally caught a she literally got a stroke and COVID simultaneously, and mm. then the whole city shut down, so they couldn't even visit her in the, in the hospital. So that all that time that's happening, and the dude's not even shedding a tear. But you know, when it comes to his function, right? Like you know, I don't know because I have a language barrier with him. He only speaks Vietnamese and Cantonese, and and I barely have those two languages. So we like use a combo of like 
English yeah. caveman hand signs and a little bit of the languages, you know, here and there. <laughs> and I, all I want to do is be able to just ask him, like, hey, how are you feeling, right? Yeah. And guy never caught a break, you know? So I know he, 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 he senses it, right, from me, yeah. from implicit actions. But, you know, I'm pretty positive there are things in there that, 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 that prevented him from being able to be the best he could be because, you know, it, he came from a tougher time. Right? He for has. Sure, right? He came from a more difficult. For sure, yeah. Difficult background. Right. Different, and then, and then, yeah. yeah. But, you know, my mom was very similar in the sense, too. But she had this idea that, you know, she valued education fundamentally where he didn't. And mm. so, um, and then, and that's why she became the pants in the family. That's why she's also you know, the role model that I, you know, focus on because everybody in society can, you know, can empathize and be wowed by like the successes of like her being like, you know, a restaurant owner and like a real estate Mongol and all that. Then my, my dad, he's really talented in his own ways. He He's a handyman. He knows how to fix houses. He loves making toilets. My God. He loves like literally making like toilets? bathrooms. Oh, okay. like, like building bathrooms. Yeah. Like we, we, we moved into our first like single home family house back in 2003 yeah. and here in Quincy. And this house came with only like two and a half bathrooms. We have five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you dudes yeah. literally making bathrooms. We now have five and a half. We Holy have a cow. full bath in the pantry of our kitchen. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this man loves yeah. plumbing. Like, yeah, he if he finds a pipe and he finds a way to get a water line, he's gonna make a bathroom. This is turned, a tough, turned, productive, like, yeah. inventive, ingenious <laughs> man. Right. It's fantastic. And so, like you know, you you could be like, like like that's this type of stuff that like you know it's like great, but like that's the stuff that he could never translate right into a career path for him because he couldn't. He, there's so many barriers: language, education, mm. certification barriers, etc. And yeah. then you know. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it all goes back to that. And like, you know, he was never good at, uh, managing his temper or dealing with people. And mm. there's, there's probably psychological things that he never had addressed, but he got shit done <laughs> and he's helping other people. Yeah, shit. Well, get I'm, shit I'm gonna, done. I'm going to put right? in my, my random two cents here. Also tangentially related again, but <laughs> when, whenever the thing is, too, is that whenever, whenever people that are of more minority status start getting more uh, angry or like not okay with the situation. It's put, it's framed against them. Like they're being yeah. uncivilized. Right. You know, like yeah. that's, a, that's, something, that's something I've seen and, you know, it's frustrating obviously to watch, but. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and, and like, you know, point in case, like the black community gets that as like the full brunt of it, you know, full yeah. hard uh, yeah. on that one. Right, like there's a reason why the stereotype of like the angry black woman, right, and then the dangerous black man exists is is for that very reason, right? Exactly. So, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. What was the uh, the Brady Bunch uh, background that you have? What was the reason for that earlier? I forget now. <laughs> I'm just what was uh, the reference. I was talking about like my upbringing, right? Trying to shape my identity outside ah, of the, yeah, you yeah. know. Okay. The societal views of being boxed in and yada yeah, yada. Yeah, yeah. So gotcha. Dude, if I could transition. do that, mine would be a uh, press your luck where it's like no whammy, no whammy, no whammy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no whammy. Yeah. Uh, no whammy. Nice. All right. So we have discovered a ton about Joey. You're an, you're an amazing man. <laughs> I, yeah. I admire yeah. all the things that you've uh, accomplished and done, and it seems like you've been on quite a journey and an adventure. Uh, you have oh, it's only of, getting started, baby. Yeah. Well, I was gonna ask what awesome. uh, what are your aspirations? What's on your horizon? What are you What are you looking forward to? What's What's coming up so, for Joey? Because of the fact that sort of I unlocked a, a nice package cheat sheet in terms of like you know sustainable investments, um, I'm just focusing mainly on that to build my capital again, and then going ahead and building that 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 sort of startup company that's gonna be uh, basic, you know prototyping off of my 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 car shop so it, it allowed me to create more ideas the more i saw the automotive industry the more i saw the bottlenecks the more i saw the pain points and and in the transaction aspects and the you know mm. the the speed and efficiency aspect of it so it gave me ideas so that's great but that's just like a 
a side project from that point. I would say from like the main biggest goals that I really have is it goes back to the idea that I have this like model that um, I have built up in my early teens when I served the Latinx community in the in a education program called TAG or Talented and Gifted Latinos, mm -hmm. and it's it's actually housed at UMass Boston, the very university where I finished my degrees, mm -hmm. and so you know um, the idea of of like I live to serve and I'm, I'm this idea of service to my community service to the people and and as a token of appreciation of like you know what they've provided for me they made me the man that i am and then vice versa giving back to the community and making that you know be helping shape that 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 community too so i i was creating uh i'm i'm all, the end goal is like you know when i'm doing my own like jeff bezos level stuff too uh, I'm going to try to use the the vehicles of philanthropy in a sustainable way and being able to, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound like Jeff Don't Bezos worry. at all. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, more like his wife, any if anything. Okay. Um, He's not famous yeah. for being uh, super giving. It, it, exactly. Well, I just meant in terms of the monetary aspect of it. Okay. Um, but using that, uh, there's a way in which you can actually create, like, you know, basically the equivalent of a trust fund, but for nonprofits, but for, uh, 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 you know, um, charitable uh, causes, and then using the revenues and the, and the profits from those uh, endeavors to be able to just sustainably fund, you know, these efforts to uh, specifically, um, you know, help, you know, the the causes that I feel like that are going to be most influential. So essentially similar to like a Melinda, uh, you know, Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation kind of deal. But I'm not Wait, sure so you, what So you want to make a billion dollars so you can give it away? Yeah, essentially. That's way better than Lim over here. He wants to shoot fucking drones with a shotgun. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, that's we not that We can still much. do both. Well, it, well, it, it, can, <laughs> it can be part of a fun... No, 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 you're thinking small. Now, now, take that, and now it's a fundraiser for people like Jeff Bezos and all those other guys that want to shoot drones yeah. with a shotgun. Yeah? Yeah. It's gonna you might, be, you might be, open that shit in Vegas. Be, you, could, you could charge more yeah. than the drones cost. It'd be a cool structure. People would do no it. No kidding, People right? would love to waste fucking I mean, money you in Vegas. Get, you can get amazing. pretty cheap drones these days. You know, yeah. those like little yeah. cheap, like, you yeah. know, China ones are only like $100. Bucks, charge, right? people yeah. charge, charge people to fly the drones and charge people to shoot Charge people like 10... <laughs> right. Charge people like $10,000 you know per <laughs> ticket and then you know give them a steak that you cook right on a slab of like rock right in the nevada desert <laughs> yeah with a fire created by the drone battery <laughs> yeah exactly you gotta you gotta shoot your own energy source for your steak you right, have to do twists exactly. on the whole <laughs> pick out your lobster the whole hunting guy. aspect right yeah it, it's it's animal cruelty free <laughs> hunting you gotta, you gotta Yo, hunt. we're, you gotta we're on something fire, we're on something right here Patent Discovered pending, everybody. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, totally a bit a tangent. A long time ago, you mentioned uh, um, investing in financial markets. I'm assuming stocks. What what what's your story behind mm -hmm. that, and kind of uh, how did you get started? Wait, how'd you make the hundred grand to open the auto shop with? We need the secret to making that, tons of money. Uh, okay, so uh, similar situation because I had the experience back in the first recession, right? Yeah. I learned a lot about the energy sector, and it's ironic because it's been a big focus lately as of now. So, mm. um, but uh, I so when I when I when oil became like my big bre bread and butter, uh, uh, or the energy sector became my bread and butter in terms of like my investment portfolio in general, mm. I took a break from investing when I was like you know, focusing more on like my, 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 my normal, like career stuff. And then when the, uh, the pandemic happened, my $27,000 that I had in my brokerage account became 11 grand. Ooh. And then from that point on, I was like, well, we're here again, right in yeah. the same position we were before. But the difference is I had the experience of last time, but this time is not a financial recession. This time it's a, uh, it's a literal external factor that's happening. And because I work in clinical research, not that I had any like investor like uh, uh, leverage or anything like that, mm -hmm. I knew that this thing can be curtailed. I knew that this pandemic can be curtailed. It, it, how long it dragged out was definitely not within my projections, neither mm. anyone's projections, especially since I like, you know, knew that the tools were coming. Mm. It was just, 
um, of the right place, the right time with the right experience, right? And then being able to just go ahead and execute. So I literally liquidated every th position I had in that 11K and then just went ahead and just did what I what I knew best, which is just focus on the energy sector. And then 11 became 22 and then 22 became, you know, the next, you know, flip. And then from there, moving forward, it exponentially grew because of the stimulus and right when that process was going to happen, right when that process was going to happen, I already had moved into long positions uh, on on options. So my so options became much more focused to be able to leverage what was going on. So there was just a huge amount of just like you know uh, up upturn because mm. at that point in time I was in at the right place at the right time, and yeah, then right. um, yeah, and like you know the moment that you know it was negative like 17 dollars a barrel like that was just the easy in right it was not a secret right anybody could free have been, oil you know exactly pretty much no not free oil we will pay you to take our oil right imagine yeah. we could be in that situation right now you know what i mean so the the juxtaposition is is a very easy one once you've isolated like the players right because opec is a really big player in the energy sector and the u.s industry sector is its own kind of weird bubble and i can go into that a much later time but um mm. but never nevertheless i developed a, a strategy that really uh, allows me to to, to know what the trickle effects are and how each of the large cap, mid cap, and small caps get affected by more macro based kind of events. So by that point, I've already moved, got my portfolio to about 80 grand. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, semiconductors became the big thing, right? Everybody and their grandma is trying to get a, a RTX 3080. And I'm standing in line in Micro Center, freezing my ass off, trying to hope that a truck comes by, right? Mm -hmm. And so, that's when it gave me the idea that, hmm, semiconductors is technically the future, right? <laughs> and at the same token, Literally. there's a huge demand on it, right? And yeah. so it's just like, and crypto, right, exploded. I was like, right place, right time, I got the right tools for it. So now I developed a covered call strategy because as I was doing this, same timing, I already created the investor group, right? The the trying to help yeah. my friends out with the fundamentals. And then time and time again, I kept getting asked, I want to get into options, but I'm like risk averse. I'm like, mm. options is like the, the yeah. very definition of like, you know. Yeah, you can't get some risk like, that. Right. And so I was like, okay, I, I got to figure out a way how I can fucking bento box a strategy for the risk averse person. And then with enough research and at the same time, the inspiration behind the semiconductor field, I was like, I got it. It's a cover call strategy in the semiconductor field. And then, yeah. And then basically being able to do, you know, a strategy where there's literally no downside, right? But then there's some pretty decent gains mm -hmm. and the gains come in the form of premiums from the options. And that if the, if the stock goes up, you are forced to sell your stocks at a profit, but guess what? Everybody loves profit. If the stock yeah. goes down, you reset the 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 the, the you know you reset the 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 uh, basically the contracts is worth expired. Then you can open a new contract and get your next set of premium. So mm -hmm. that was actually netting you know ten to twelve percent per every hundred batch of uh shares of this particular semiconductor triple bowl etp so yeah and then wow. from then on you know i just been teaching that and you know it's uh it it works well it, the there's a big hurdle when it try you try to teach somebody options but once they get over that it's a rinse and repeat process and actually the name of the facebook group is now called rinse and repeat and so <laughs> yeah nice when, when you prepackage a strategy like that and you know you 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 focus on where you mitigate your risks on all aspects of it and then you just like you know let people uh confirm that they're okay with a certain you know cap on their returns and then they just have to rinse and repeat it every month people are okay with that and i was just like oh okay well, let's do it so, yeah, yeah i'm okay so with only making 10 percent a month yeah, okay. yeah, times 12, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I join your Facebook group? So, yeah. You can, most certainly. Yeah. Oh, Joey's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I love Joey. 
Yeah. Um, and then what? you're just going to get like a laundry list of YouTube videos that's both resources from like YouTube itself and then the re the YouTube videos that I've recorded that teaches some of the fundamentals. As oh, well. I can't skip straight to the profit part? Uh, Yeah. I mean, if you're willing to make mistakes and get messy, sure. It's um, your money. Okay. I thought you were giving me the strategy. <laughs> it, it is the strategy okay it is it is it is the strategy but i just want to i i make sure that every step of the way you understand what you're doing because it's very easy for somebody to just literally you know get the expiration date wrong or change the strike price wrong and then yeah. you know they it's not that they lose they just don't maximize that profitability aspect of it can i do um, it through, and right uh, now oh go ahead hmm Go ahead. I was just saying right now, it's actually a pretty sweet time to be in it because there's a bunch of volatility happening right now in the oh, yeah. market. So, mm -hmm. Can I do it through Vanguard or do I need a different uh, platform? to do Any both? broker. Uh, okay. But it's preferable if you have a broker that gives you like advanced trading software that comes packaged with like your, your stuff. So TD Ameritrade has Thinkorswim. Uh, Schwab has fucking what was it think street smart <laughs> edge and then like they they name all their fancy softwares right. their own proprietary stuff yeah um but you you'll it's easier to do that because then it allows you to do what's called multi-leg strategies a lot cleaner mm. um and you also get um because because you can also close positions and open positions like rolling with only getting charged like one transaction fee because with options i think for my broker td ameritrade they charge you like 65 cents for an options trade so if i want to close a position and open a new one mm. then they're going to charge you 65 cents at a time right and yeah. there's a time gap between it i might lose right on some stuff but with the software and with multi-lay uh positions you can do that all that in one go and then only get charged one time so it saves okay, you a few cool. cents they add up yeah like my my tax thing you know when we when i did the 1099 on my taxes for 2021 i had 900 something 900 thousand dollars plus worth of transactions just moving back and forth that's like normal long positions and then yeah. the last third of it was just the the, the covered call strategy Fascinating. Is, is that something that you don't see that you could sustain on? Meaning, say, say if Joey now were to just choose that you're going to go and stock trade, swing trade or day trade, can you sustain your life on that? Or is that something that's too risky? Um, when you have a big enough bankroll, you certainly can. And so the funny thing is that when I was in the 100K range, it was netting me about 11k to 12k a month so more than my paycheck yeah <laughs> and then um then like the then the opportunity to buy the shop came around so i was like all right well i have a capital so i might as well do that hmm. um and then my 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 uh my portfolio dwindled down to 20 and then in the past month and uh i think it's like what since end of december to what uh, now April. So let's just yep. say it's almost four months. I'm like at 47 now. So it doubled in like four months. Okay. Right. Um, the, the key is that you want, you want it to self sustain. So it, so the strategy is really important that it has to be, uh, it's, it, 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 there's an exponential curve, but it only happens when there's a lot of capital involved. Right. And mm. specifically when you reach a point where, you can now get another batch of 100 shares by just purely the profits from the premiums itself. So it becomes self-sustainable. So let's just pretend that the stock price is $10. And, and to get 100 shares, you need 1000 bucks. And so, and, and if you get a premium of, let's say, 10% of that you know, $1,000, that's about 100 bucks, right? Now, in order for you to get another 100 shares of that same stock, you need another 1000 bucks. But if you have $10,000 and you sell uh, 10 contracts one time in a month, you now have $1,000 in premium. You can now buy another set of 100 shares to then now get another $100. You know what I mean? So it becomes self-sustaining and it actually just then, you, not, you don't have to put money into it once it's reached that 10 right. contract mark. Mm-hmm. So, I need, so I need that's to have a ten thousand dollar spot month. right there. Is there what uh 
I, I want to. So is it a? What's the trick? Th- that's kind of what I'm. I want to kind of get at is right. So is it with a market that's going up, or are you also? Nope. Have you? You want volatility, so that's the reason why picking your pony is correct. Uh, is important, right? Because if you did this strategy on, let's say, I don't know, uh, well, uh, AT and T. AT is so fucking rock solid, like it just barely moves, right? Because that's right. why people buy AT and T because it's a what's called a value stock. It it provides dividends. It doesn't really move with the market, right? It just simply yeah. just does its own thing. So there's low, what's called implied volatility. So with low implied volatility, the premiums won't be as high, despite the fact that the price of the stock itself is relatively high. But I digress. In any case, (laughs) you want high volatility, right? So something that's just fucking bouncing around all the time. So that's why semiconductors was kind of like a, a great idea to just go into because, you know, that shit was volatile as hell. But yeah. at least you know it will never go to zero because if if all the semiconductors in the world went to shit, we have a bigger problem at our hands than just your investment portfolio. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No one would be able to function. Wait, yeah. so, so this that's means... why it was just enough volatility. Yeah, this this means that you're yep. very happy that the Nazis in the Ukraine have offended Russia and have started military operations and, uh, and trouble in the energy market. Yes and no. So the energy market stuff, I've, by that point in time, I've already invested 90% of my portfolio in semiconductors. So I've already moved on from, from that okay. because the energy market was great because in the, in the time, right, in my beginning phases of learning how uh. to invest and learning how to trade and, and, and is, is the idea that I can, I can track the, the potential ups and downs of the energy sector by the macro events, by different announcements, by different earnings, et cetera, et cetera, right? The old school way of thinking of that. Yeah. But then now with the strategy, it doesn't matter what happens because <laughs> if all of semiconductors decided to, to eat shit right now, well, great, all my contracts expire and I don't have to sell any of my shares. And I have, you know, quite a few, right? Yeah. And so if they were to go up, Oh, okay, cool. Then uh, uh, my contracts are forced to sell, but my strike prices are five dollars ahead of what I paid for them. So I'm gonna get five hundred extra dollars times one hundred times however many contracts. And then when the prices go low again, I just simply buy. And then as I've learned other option strategies, I learn how to add a strangle to the strategy. So now. I can shop for sh- for for stocks and get paid for it, and mm. I can get paid for selling my stocks. I get paid every single step of the way, and it, after after I unlock like the full potential of this strategy, I was just like, God damn, like this feels like cheating, but at the same yeah. time, it's not. It's just the way in which the game works. You're just playing house at mm. the end of the day, and so- then being a contract seller, you have so much power. If you're gonna, if your contract's in the money and the buyer's gonna win like win right in the situation you could just roll you could just roll your contract and push the goalpost further and push it up if you choose to and basically hit the reset dial on that and and never have to be in a situation where you're not in a favorable situation what would uh if someone wanted to give you fifteen thousand dollars whatever number no he's not he's not a financial advisor so what is the legal legal what what's the red tape for you to if if someone wanted to give you money to invest into what you're doing with the stock with stock the stock market is it something that you could do or what's well the, the I, I would just teach you how to do it I honestly what would just they, teach you how to they, do it what if they what if they were to say hey I I don't even want to deal with it you could take a fifteen percent cut. <laughs> Then you're just my mom, and I'm just managing her. <laughs> I'm basically creating her retirement slush fund. You're you're way like better than all months. of your siblings right now. <laughs> That's just, why you're you're her favorite. You <laughs> she destroyed her four sisters. You left, that out. You left that, that out earlier. Yeah, yeah. Those but, useless but, girls yeah, I mean, she had before you. At the end of the you. day, she's she still hasn't retired. My dad's retired, but she still hasn't retired. She still has the restaurant. Twenty seven years, right? The yeah. least I can do is make sure that she doesn't have to worry about anything financial. Because it's like I keep asking her, why why aren't you retiring? And then she's just like, eh, well, you know. What do you do? Half of it is because she she doesn't want to feel idle, right? So yeah. it goes back to what you know. You're you, you can vibe with that sentiment. And the other half of it is like you know, uh, you know, I don't I don't feel comfortable that I could probably live off of it. And I'm like, like mom, you have like 
four investment properties and like you know rental properties and like you know yeah. you got the restaurant that you could sell for like a lump sum and then at the same token like i'm basically building you a slush fund that can serves for like 11 to 12k you know a, a month on average so i think you'll be okay plus you know but, a guy you know, that I can make bathrooms appear out of thin air <laughs> yeah well he's uh he, he doesn't want to do that stuff anymore so i'm the one fixing bathrooms you know how my dad was away for a, a month in vietnam right i fi- i fixed seven toilets seven while he was gone wow yeah. wait are these ones that he built because uh one of them was my own shops but you know okay. so six yeah <laughs> Well, sounds like he's terrible at making toilets. He can make them appear. No, 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 work. not ours. Not, oh, okay, not okay. ours. The, the, the tenants. The tenants. Uh, he's okay. the equivalent of like, the super. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> that makes a little bit more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yes. So have you have you thought about yeah, that? Try- that would be a really bad toilet. <laughs> no, don't tell anybody. We Sorry. want to join his Facebook group and make 10 grand a month. But... But you still have, you have to, it sounds like that Facebook group is about teaching you and you still have to do the hard work of picking yeah. your... Do I have to put in an hour a day or what's the uh, commitment here? Once I, uh, once I, I watch mean, all the videos... I just did it for... Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to package it so that you can just watch the videos so it just creates more capacity on my end. Yeah. But once you're like done with that phase, then, you know, and then I can, I can, you know, walk you through like, you know, sinking your teeth into the, the you know, going through the motions. And then you, I can QC before you even fire yeah. an order out if that's like, you know, a direction that I feel like is good. Yeah, because no, but at once the end I'm... of the day, what I'm going to... Yeah, once I'm up to, uh, you know, once I'm up to, hey, I know what I'm doing, how much on, because yep. you, you got to set your orders and everything, right? So how much effort a day yeah. is that? Oh, three is minutes that- uh, per month. Oh, <laughs> man, three minutes a month. <laughs> That's- yeah. <laughs> your first go, maybe an hour, because I'm going to basically make sure that you understand every aspect of it. But yeah, once you've set it and forget it, uh, or at least like understand the mechanics of it all, yeah. then, you know, you, you do this process as often as you want or as, as uh, less time as you want. Shit, you could even set a, a full contract for like two years out and just collect like two thousand dollars in premium and then just say i'm good and then just walk away yeah i like joey's plan a lot okay (laughs) i was ready to spend an hour a day on this okay okay you also need to make sure that your brokerage account is at least at level one options trading uh authorization so how do i get there uh, if you've done options before then you're all set but if you've never done it before then, I always thought yeah, options was a scam to... where like young guys get excited about it and they're oh I'm gonna be rich I'm gonna be an options trader and then two months later they're not talking about <laughs> options at all because they've lost right. all their money because it's 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 a wild bronco and the worst the the difference between like a stock and an option is that yeah. um, one of the biggest key differences without getting too deep into it is that it has time uh, an expiration date so yeah. it's like a it's like imagine if you bought a stock right and then. 30, it's only good for 30 days and it has a lot it, its value is based off of its extrinsic value not it's an intrinsic value right. so options are just contracts and contracts are like insurance policies so whether somebody feels like that they're thinking that the stock is going to go up or down there's two yeah. types of contracts or options for that a call or a put and so you are the seller of that contract so you get a premium like an insurance premium yeah to say i'll i'll lock in this contract for you for 30 days if it goes above this strike price and if it yeah. goes above that strike price or at that strike price you have the option to be able to buy 100 shares from me right at that price now puts are the opposite if the stock goes down below that, I am obligated as the seller of that contract to set, to buy 100 shares from you at that mm-hmm. strike price. So if you set your parameters right in the strategy, even if you're forced to sell or forced to buy, you're good. Well, I mean, that's the strangle. So let's just remove the, the sell, the, the, the put part. But just the, con- the cover call, yeah. it, you always set your strike price higher than what you paid for. So therefore, if you're ever forced to sell, you're selling at a, a, at a profit. So you don't care. You just liquidate, right? Yeah. And you gain an additional profit. So it's a win now, win later strategy. Yeah. And I only have to pay taxes if I make more than forty grand a year, right? Capital gains, short-term capital gains, which is twenty two. Ah, it's free money. Oh wait, is uh wait, short short-term capital gains 
Is is that the does that fall in the forty thousand? I don't know. I'm just talking to my ass. I'm not sure. Yes, that is correct. Forty oh. forty one thousand yes. dollars is the maximum you 40. can make in short term capital gains before it converts into just regular income. Forty three. I think it's. Well, anyways, whatever. I'm not a tax accountant, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> forty three thousand. Yeah. It's something in the forties, but you're right. It's it's like forty something. Yeah, it's a very specific number, but. Let's just say, look, put it this way: you can live off of that, right? Yeah, it, it's definitely a great supplement, and you can live off of that. So, yeah, I see. I believe Joey because he bought an auto so, shop with the uh, with the <laughs> proceeds from his activities. Everybody else I've ever heard talk yeah. about options. Shout out to Bob's Automotive Services in Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> if there's ever a Massachusetts person listening yes. here, dude, I would go to your shop right now. I'm actually high struggling over here getting shops to. Oh look at yeah, truck. yeah. The shops are like, yeah, the Ford well, what's dealer wrong? is like, what's went, wrong with it? Uh, I'm getting a host of error messages on my dash. It's a, it's an old Ford Raptor. Gotcha. And all the online okay. forums say there's a speed sensor that's probably throwing it, but then the, the guy I usually go to doesn't believe it. So he won't fix it. And then the pet boys won't, doesn't know how to reprogram speed sensors. So it's, it's this long saga of electronic. I uh, get you. Yeah. yeah. I also remember Ford had a, for the F-150s had a recall on the brake lines break busting so mm. you might want to check on that excuse uh, me yeah i think i might upgrade to steel braided lines because i like that kind of shit <laughs> yeah i'm still waiting for mine in the mail mm. supply supply you know chain issues right yeah because i i just bought a corvette uh last october nice. so actually yeah it, i bought i i, I saw it because it was a it was my racing partner's college friend that was selling it in north carolina and I was not interested in getting an American like an American car. I was actually yeah. aiming for the new Z that was coming out because I was going to retire my STI. Mm. And um, and then um, yeah, I saw the ad and it was like this Sunfire yellow, and it got all the right mods that I would do to it if I did own it. And I was just like, oh shit! As is this, this a C five that's all tracked out or C six? C6, okay. yeah, 566 nice. wheel horsepower. has got the heads done. Oh, nice. um, <clears throat> and then, like, yeah, it's a Z06. And uh, I basically, it was, I saw that ad on Sunday. I bought, yeah. a, bought a plane ticket on Monday, flew down there, bought the car, and drove it back up to Massachusetts, 800 nice. plus miles back. Ooh, yeah. nice. You, you can't beat the LS it was power. A great, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, it's undeniable. I, I, I'm a believer now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to walk us into the final question section. You got about 20 minutes, five questions, and here we go. First question, what right. great daily habits, habit or habits do you have? Uh, being like always wanting to learn more, always wanting to improve myself and, and having a conscious effort of like this idea that this is what I want. This is this is what I want to like do because – it, you know, learning because you're forced to or learning because you have to is not fun, but learning because you're genuinely curious and ultimately it of uh, providing itself a practical application is something that you guys have already been listening to as it's, you know, uh, the fruits of its labor without me even like trying. Right. It, and so, yeah, what, that's 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 what I would say. What would it be? specifically that you're doing to to learn meaning is it picking up a book every day is it picking up a magazine is it watching youtube is it i haven't picked up a book in like 10 plus years um but <laughs> books are for old but people I'm, <laughs> but i'm but i'm reading a lot right because uh like you know there's like articles and then there's like so i would say start with a a, a specific field or a, a sector or something that you're interested in so if you talk about firearms right and then you get into firearms now you gotta i want to learn how to field strip it i want to learn how to modify it i want to learn how to shoot better i want to learn how to this and you go into that rabbit hole right and then suddenly it's 3 a.m and you're like oh fuck i got work tomorrow but you know what <laughs> i i learned from jerry michelek so you know it's all good <laughs> and so um but 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 it's those 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 moments where you're like you you, you were just into it right and it, it it didn't feel forced it's not something that you did because it's like homework or some shit it's like this is the equivalent of you netflix binging but you binged on information and then you you walked out of there with so much more um so yeah so just what like rabbit? being hungry no matter what the medium is huh uh, oh go ahead go ahead sorry what was that go ahead finish up yeah 
So I was just saying, no, no, no matter what the medium is, right? Books, articles, you know, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, Skillshare, Coursera, take your pick, right? If you're the type of person that likes in-person stuff, then do more of that. If you're the type of person that likes videos, do more of that. Uh, don't don't put yourself in a box. Just focus on the things that you know you're going to get interested in. But pick a subject, pick a, a thing that you're interested in. And then the other end of the spectrum is, if you are afraid of something or you have an assumption of something and you have limited information about something or a negative a connotation about something, learn more about it. Like, because mm. social media and especially is a feedback loop of your confirmation bias. You're less likely to pick an article from a political affiliation that you're not associated with, right? Because you just don't, you just don't want to hear it. But I challenge everybody to open, have an open mind to at least look at what they have to say and mm. then look at something that you are in a comfortability zone. And then when you see that there's information that does coincide, now you can triangulate. Well, at least both of those sides agree that this happened, right? Boom. Okay, cool. So I can focus on that as being more at least truthful than rather than just focusing on the opinion aspects of it, right? Because that information these days and the idea of research, right, has a new connotation in our society now is that firing up Google and picking the third option is like, you know, like people's go to, but it's like, when was the last time you actually looked at a peer review article, looked at actual different sources, and then seeing if they all say the same thing or different things, and then making sure that you understand when you compare and contrast, what is actually being going on here? And then you can say, okay, well, at least this, this, and this happen. And then that, you know, for a fact. And Everything else, speculation. Everything else, opinions. And then just go from there. Facts. What uh, What's the current uh, top subject or topic that you're in the rabbit hole with that you're currently Raccoons. <laughs> hmm, yes. This, raccoons are my spirit animals, if you haven't uh, noticed. <laughs> Trash right? pandas? They get, they, actually, it, it, this is a great segue because, you know, the rabbit hole, right? It's the idea of, like, seeing that shiny object and going, oh, shit, yeah, let's go invest oh i'm gonna play with this right and get stuck inside a dumpster you know at two o'clock in the morning behind the mcdonald's um so let's see i mean yeah i i, I spent like last weekend or something like yeah last sunday i was like 3 a.m i was just looking up like different modifications uh for the z06 for the corvette mm -hmm. because i'm i'm procrastinating in race season we're already in april but yeah. i'm missing out on the coldest like start of the season and with a 566 rear wheel drive car i think i'm okay missing out on the colder <laughs> days to keep myself safe um but the car is just not ready period and i have so much going on i only can work on the evenings and weekends on the car so yeah, just car stuff currently. Um, then the other rabbit hole is um, uh, actually learning coding. So uh, two of the people that uh, this dude's eating too many the pickles. <laughs> yeah, dude, you got to easy up on the two, pickles, man. Two people in my investment group is actually sharing with me like you know how like that you know like it is relatively easy according to them to get into coding, right? And I take that with the skepticism that you're probably thinking as of right now right and so i myself right just had that negative reaction to it right i don't believe you so therefore my first reaction is okay i'm gonna go learn more right i'm gonna go see for it myself i'm gonna go and validate this myself so i think it's that's, easy that's to, the type it's of, easy to get into it it's it's hard to get good at it as is i think it would, it would take a lot of effort and time to get good at it i mean based off of the consensus of what I've hear is that um, three things to be true in modern coding as of now is that one is that it's very just based off of uh, project based in the sense that the more projects you've worked on, the more experience you've gained. The second thing is that are you good at problem solving, right, is more important than and whether or not you've memorized the syntax or an actual language, right? And then the third thing is that can you Google search? <laughs> and that's what they all say. Was yeah. it GitHub? If you can Google search, uh, yep, GitHub, exactly. Uh, GitHub, exactly. So if you uh, if you know what you're looking for, and then you you know that it can be done, you just have to go find the syntax that that solves it, it for you and modify it to your to your sort to to your needs. Yeah. 
Mainly Stack so Overflow that, would be the answers. I, I'm a software engineer. I'm a programmer. I've been doing it for like twenty. Oh, uh, okay. Twenty years. So if you have questions, feel free to ask me. I'll, I'll try to point you in the right. I way. appreciate that. Um, nice. Thank Stack you. O- Overflow will probably have the code that you could copy. So if you could Google like, "Hey, I want to whatever," like I want to get data from a database into my mm-hmm. web application, uh, most likely you're going to Google it and it's going to point to a Stack Overflow par- uh, website that has your answer. Hopefully, uh, GitHub would makes be, total sense. If you're looking to, uh, for what, I Just don't know. like share projects, right? It's you're more about a, like project sharing, a big, open source kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're looking for a project that almost encompasses an entire thing, like say you have a fish tank and you want to program lights, someone probably already has a Raspberry Pi hardware right. GitHub of a project that controls that light using Raspberry Pi and they probably already programmed it. So you just need to go mm-hmm. get a copy and then edit it. And then you'd have exactly. to search Google Stack Overflow for specific changes like, oh, I want the light to turn green. So you go right. search Google and hopefully it has that. I want to fuck up all these fish on a 13 and a half hour <laughs> yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? RGB, like, <laughs> yeah. the fish are just like tripping balls like all day, oh. all night. Yeah. But uh, but awesome. programming does have it's it's a big rabbit hole in itself. Like you may mm-hmm. l- learn C programming, C plus plus, C sharp. Oh man, that's Java. my first language. That's the that's the, where I got my F in in engineering. Oh. So I, oh. I started with C, and Trauma. it was just like oh, it was awful. Well, but then as I've been told, everything is uh, what's that term? It's like you you start typing it, or you start you know uh um, you know putting the keywords in and it just automatically starts free determining what kind of function yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or type or thing that you are. So I think type forward, I think that's what it's type called. Type forward. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like Python can do that and so, you know, other, so other programs. Yeah. What he's so I've learned. About. So I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, what he's talking about is in, in, uh, you download an, well, an IDE an integrated development environment. So you download an IDE and then that has the syntax in its dictionary so then as soon as you type if you know in c sharp it's response.write which is the code is the syntax to get the program to write something onto the screen mm-hmm. so start as soon as you start to type res yeah it shows all the possible res and response is hopefully there and you just mm. tap on that and then you press dot and then i'll have all mm-hmm. the parameters response.write it'll have that whole it might have response.n response dot uh yeah redirect or whatever so it has a whole list and you could just yeah. choose so it's, it's super easy it's like writing an entire essay on like predictive text on yeah, your, yeah, your yeah. phone yeah 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 actually that yeah that's a good way of explaining <laughs> yeah. it yeah so, hey guys i'm really i'm really excited about uh i'm excited and passionate about a new rabbit hole called 10% a month <laughs> and <laughs> and i'm isn't I'm, everybody i'm terrified of options trading cuz i've never seen it work well so I'm going to go. Yeah, just do like paper trading or like a simulation like yeah. portion of like your trading software or just like a, a free one that's out there and just practice it. You don't have to go in with actual money. And I, I always recommend it to everybody. But for yeah. some reason, not a single soul has ever practiced with it. They just, just want to gamble. Just trusted me. And <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is a different feeling. And trust me, it's like, yeah. <laughs> No, no, no lesson is, is, is well learned than one that you lose money. And when yeah. I dabbled into day trading, that was the, some of the harshest lessons I've ever learned. Some mm. of the highest highs and lowest lows. <laughs> yeah. My suggestion on the programming thing is have a goal in mind. And then, um, mm-hmm. if you, if, if the project is super big, if you, if like, say your goal is to create a predictive options, choosing program, that will put place a a put or a call for you that one's probably yeah. really big so chunk it out right 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 make it make it yep. small like how do i make a mm-hmm. program talk to vanguard how do, does vanguard yep. have a I, api for me to talk to chunk out those right. goals and and have the big level goal and then chunk them out to smaller mm-hmm. goals mm. that, that's my suggestion Sounds because good. if you don't have that goal with programming it the rabbit hole with programming is so large that you'll get lost so mm. you need a goal you yep. need something in the horizon I appreciate that because that triangulates everything that all of my other colleagues and friends have said about that is that you, you want to pick a project and then just focus on that and just learn through the idea of like 
doing something some something so simple right you know so like the equivalent of learning to play an instrument and then doing mary had a little lamb before you do a beethoven piece so yeah yeah i get it i appreciate that thank you uh next question what do you know or think of cryptocurrency <laughs> it's so funny when i saw that in the list of questions i was like uh i don't even think about like what is the the, the the uh -oh, frame of, framework of this podcast but oh, uh you know uh hello can you oh, hear me? The, oh, you're back okay. you're back yeah so the so, frame yeah so it's so funny that we talked about all these investments oh yeah, go, go ahead no go, go ahead go ahead yeah and no crypto so it's just end. like how we were talking about all this invest right right that um that this is part of my story yet the irony of it all that you guys also have like crypto uh prompts into that so cryptocurrency to me is just like any other kind of floating currency the way I see it. The, the only difference is, is that it takes in its form, right, uh, a very technologically advanced way in which how it's in conducted and in particular how it's even uh, procured, right, through the, the depending on like the, the, the type of uh, interface it is. So as we speak right now, I'm mining Ethereum using my GPU. So, um, Dirty the, bastard. the irony is it all. <laughs> You're yeah. a monster. The irony of it all. This is why is you want to own video cards. Uh, <laughs> right. It's also the reason why it's kind of spotty in my background changing. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, uh, what's it called? I, I think the sheer volume of the number of crypto that's out there is what's going to invalidate the chances that like the first pioneer cryptos have created um, is is going to create some some mud in the water, so to speak. And not to say that they aren't valid themselves is the fact that if you have thousands to choose from, and some being more technologically advanced than others, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, what sells from a business perspective is marketing, right? Apple at the beginning and the iPod and all that stuff was not technologically superior than any other MP3 player at that time. The it zoo, just happened the that they amazing. market the sh <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I was actually even in a more niche group called the Arcos, which actually was yep, the first yep. MP4 player. Yep, yep. And that thing was I'm, amazing. I'm rocking this thing. And wait a and minute, you guys a bunch of nerds over here. <laughs> hey, exactly. wait, shut up. So yeah. And, Go back to so, building Massachusetts landmarks. That's your place. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You can find me at uh, Faneuil Hall. <laughs> <laughs> so so like you know it doesn't matter how good your fucking product is if you can't market it and so bitcoin is already self-marketing because everybody talks about that right it's become the number one in essence look at it like the u.s currency it may not be the best but it is the best by default that everybody talks about it uses it etc mm -hmm. ethereum comes in second place etc 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 and so um, that's just how I feel about it. And the reason why I mine it versus trading it is because if knock on wood, nothing comes from the crypto phase that we're in, well, guess what? I just wasted a bunch of electricity and then degraded some silicone, mm. but it was one hell of a ride. And then if it does come from something, well, at least I have my piece of the pie. And mm. funny th story about that is that when this was, when I was introduced to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, this was back in 2011. Yeah, 2011, when my college friend actually told me about it. And I, being mm. the person that I am, was curious to learn the mechanics of it. So I did a mining pool. I started mining uh, uh, Bitcoin using my GPU. And I had 0.21 Bitcoin in my hard drive, my SSD. That computer I had retired and I just mm. stored the SSD and I thought nothing of it. I didn't even know what the price of crypto was. My cousin in 2014, uh, no, sorry, 17, yeah. wanted a gaming computer. So I built him one. Oh, I've been building gaming computers since I was 12, by the way. Um, and so, uh, so I built him one and I didn't have any spare SSDs lying around. So I grabbed the one that had the, the big, the cold wallet in it uh, <laughs> and uh, I wiped it, put an OS uh, onto it. Uh, and now 0.2 Bitcoin is now lost in the ether. 
Uh, what's so, that yeah. worth today? About seven 12, grand or something? Twelve thousand. There, yeah. No seven more. Or yeah. If it's fifty yeah, grand five. for a Bitcoin, a, a, a fifth <clears throat> of that, then so oof on my part, right? Mm. So yeah. So that's like the idea is that you know I'm never going to what's it called? Put all my eggs in one basket in something. But definitely, I will uh, love that to speculate. <laughs> I will love, I will love to dabble in it for sure. And the irony of it all is that it, it, for some reason, when I get interested in something, that it always ends up paying in dividends, the right place at the right time. I started buying gold. I got into gold coins as like a collector and as like a, a diversification of my portfolio. So I bought gold and platinum and palladium coins in 2000, end of 2018. Yeah. <laughs> end of 2018. And then I sold my palladium coin for three thousand one hundred dollars on eBay, nice. hmm. yeah, and I bought it for twenty one hundred, yeah, hmm. nice. So yeah, it, it was like it was a it was a sweet it was a sweet a bittersweet you know, parting, but at the same time, I know an opportunity when I see one, so I'm gonna take it. Did you uh, are you mining Ethereum or are you staking? Mining Ethereum and staking, yeah. So mm. I have uh, it's a 50 50, right? I want to be able to liquidate it if I need to, but it's staked just in case if something comes from it. Nice, awesome. Uh, get that sweet, sweet interest. The three of us, I think, are uh, me, Emmett, and uh, Joe are big uh, cryptocurrency fans. So if you ever have any questions from a software side, feel it, free to ask me. I, I look at it gotcha. maybe more from a sci fi angle. Emmett, Yo, I get you. And it's more um, probably more from a financial side of just investing. Greed. Like, <laughs> greed. <laughs> and well, then... I mean, one of my best friends is uh, is like uh, in like he, he he worked for or he's currently working for a start. Well, was a startup. Now it's like a small company in crypto. And nice. so like, you know, so I had a lot of like the the heads up because I by virtue of being curious and we talk right being yeah. able to learn more about it so he, he he even himself is in his own space right and the irony of it all is that he sees the the the, the light side and the dark side of it all and that you know the shadow economy comes with the territory of this frontier right and mm -hmm. that's really ultimately why I, I think it's the reason why uh, current fiat and governments will shut it down or try to stifle it or some way and hopefully at the only extent of it regulate it uh, you know what i mean but you know the the positives is that there's so much can be done with it um and so much can be leveraged with it and it has a lot of potential all right uh next question what's the biggest problem for humans and what do we do to fix it Great question. So, I mean, no, whew, no pressure. there's so many to choose from, right? And so, uh, but if I were to say there's a root cause of everything, right? Um, it would literally be, the biggest problem would be like, the irony is that, and, and this is a nice little saying, we got smartphones, but dumb people, right? Yeah. Um, so we're we're in a we're in a time point where we have all the fucking resources in the world at our fingertips, but we are not actualizing the full potential of the human capacity. And the irony is that we have better means to to bridge economic, educational, uh, um, socioeconomic, you know, political um, uh, b gaps, right, uh, than ever before. And we, we could solve we all the world's problems for TikTok. <laughs> yeah, we uh, not saying that TikTok in itself is the problem, but it's the idea that it is used primarily for the idea of self-consuming and perpetuating the systems in which you know, uh, um, you know, the mainstream capitalism has already like you know created for us. So all it does is just it speeds this up sticks it into our eyeballs and then day and night you know non-stop right before you need cable television for that shit now you need you, you can just get it right in your bed when you go to bed and when you wake up and not go to work and you're just stuck in that perpetual cycle and then you end up hating yourself constantly over and over and you wonder why you're saying our kids aren't getting smarter by consuming all this tick tocking 
they can but the problem is is the content right they're just dancing. so like i i i mean i did i i did a fucking tv show for kids on engineering you can kind of guess how successful that shit went uh you, you put know, it on tiktok we want, a Pe- we, we want a peabody award you can watch it on amazon video and the yeah. only time i got royalties from it was the pandemic why because every teacher in the fucking in you know mm. continent was just assigning my episodes to <laughs> the kids and mm. then and then like you know i, I suddenly got a royalty check and that's like you know, it's like 0.02% of like, you know, the whole sales, right? But then yeah. it added up and I was like, why, why all of a sudden now, right? Like, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. Because teachers were trying to struggle, trying to pivot, trying to figure out what they could give to their kids as content. So that, you know, they can, uh, you know, not die. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. Next question. What's your favorite food or dish? Ooh, tough questions. Oh. Uh, another tough one. It's even tougher than the fucking solve the world problem. Um, <laughs> I actually don't really. I'm not. I'm not like a foodie or anything like that. So it's pickles. Like I, ha- I, ha- I have like I have like comfort foods. So I'm a yeah. big burger guy. Um. So I just love a good burger. Nice. You know. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. And 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 yeah, I mean, even even when I got fucking serious, like I, I ate like a five pound burger at a, a place in in Boston called Eagles five Deli, pounder. and there's a, it's a challenge, and I saw it on Man vs Food, and and yeah. uh, the guy couldn't finish it, so I was like, you know what, I'm gonna fucking train for that, and I'm, I'm gonna go <laughs> get that because they name it after you if you if you if you win it. Yeah. And then and then they upped the challenge a whole pound. And so oh. I was like, yo, five pounds seems doable. Like, you know, uh-huh. I've eaten five pounds worth of separate burgers. I can eat one whole big one. Wow. So I finished the whole burger and I didn't touch the fries. And the and I and I did it in like forty five minutes. And the guy was like, I've never seen anyone eat the burger so fast. Like you just wow. have to finish the fries. You got like a full like forty five minutes to go. And I'm like Dude, if I even touch a fry, I'm gonna like hurl. So, uh, so he was at least nice to me to just give it to me half off. But mm. oh, like uh. two weeks later, I think someone else won the challenge, and then it went up a, a pound. And I was like, uh. "Oh, there goes my window." Mm. So yeah. yeah, I feel yeah. I feel like gluttonous when I eat a double quarter pounder. Oh man, that's that's like water to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Shout out two friends that should do this podcast. That should do this podcast. Um, who would you I'd love to see? For, who would I love to see? Um, I would love to see my friend Maria, who's also in that investment group. And she's a, a movie director and she's a professor of uh, f- uh, f- uh, film uh, cinematography at Emerson College. So, uh, yeah. And then... Nice. Uh, and then oh you you would love Bobby uh, uh, Bobby Tino so he's my Haitian American friend grew up born and raised in Dorchester learned to speak Vietnamese and then went to work at the embassy in Vietnam mm. and then actually wow. was part of like music videos for famous Vietnamese artists because you know <laughs> token black guy right oh, wow. so um, so yeah top Bobby Vino Bobby Tino will have a tons and tons of stuff and it'd just be so cool because like me you know similar to me not exactly you know bobby tino immersed himself in the culture right that he had an affinity for and so much right that he literally traveled and 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 went into those countries and when i first visited my vietnam for the very first time i was actually in the same city as him just coincidentally uh because my grandmother had her first stroke in 2015 and that's why i was there um, and so we almost met up, but he was visiting a mutual friend of ours family and he ate some like bad ban kuo or something like that. And he had mm. like the runs and he <laughs> we couldn't meet up. And uh. so it's just like, we're halfway around the world simultaneously together, coincidentally, and we can't meet up because you got the green apple splatters. And then he's just like, <laughs> and he's like, like yeah, way to put me on blast, Joey. I was just like, come on. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. like, this you're is gonna, not gonna happen again <laughs> twice you know you're gonna end on green apple splatters <laughs> i think we're going yeah. to <laughs> joey that was a, an amazing talk do you have a water to cheers with us uh, uh 
I got Joe, you got a uh, drink? fucking Greek vinaigrette. Uh, uh, you know, oh, gee, that's it. terrible. <laughs> I'm not going to drink it, but, you know. Is that the only thing you got nearby? Uh, yeah. Joey, a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for spending time with us. Joey, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Cheers. It's such a pleasure. Cheers, man. Yeah, cheers. Yep. <laughs> All right. Cheers, everyone.